Croeso i Cavabo Bui Niakit, Mark Polindri Kadari. On behalf of the board, may I welcome you all to today's meeting of the Health Board, which is again being live to the public to observe the meeting in real time. I am pleased to confirm that today we are also able to offer simultaneous interpretation so members of, can fully contribute in the language of their choice. And at this point, I will ask Larry, our translator, to explain to members how this system works. And then Larry will sit, switch the interpretation facility on. Larry, please. Um, we will switch, uh, Linus will switch on the translation in a few moments. And once she does so, you need to look for the globe or the interpretation globe at the bottom of your screen. You need to select the interpretation and then you need to press English may be done. You don't need to mute the original or anything like that, and we'll have a quick test. Um, if anybody is encountering difficulties, then if you could try and convey the message, possibly to Kate or Linos, we'll have a quick test. Linos, if you're ready, deal. Testing, one, two, three, testing. I'm testing the translation channel now. Testing, one, two, three, testing. Uh, testing, one, two, three, testing. Chair, uh, are you able to confirm that you can hear me? I'm still testing. Testing one, two, three, testing. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I, I think it's safe to assume that everybody can hear me. Yeah, Larry. Okay, uh, so I'm pleased, first of all, to welcome our new Chief Executive, Joe Whitehead, and also our new Board Secretary, Louise Brereton. In addition, I'd like to record the fact that Sue Hill, our interim director of finance has now been appointed substantively to that position. Uh, and Joe has also decided quite recently to extend the term of ARPAN as our interim medical director, supported by Kate Clark as deputy. Before Joe says a few words, I need to report the following chair's actions that have been agreed since our last board meeting. Firstly, the approval of an extension of the current lease and arrangements for a new lease December 2020 to November 21 for office accommodation for the Children's Neurodevelopment Service in the West at Park Wenai, Bangor. Secondly, the ratification of statutory health and safety policy to enable uploading the organization's external website. So Joe, if I may, I'll ask you to say a few words by way of introduction. See ya. Um, it's day 14 for me, and I'm delighted uh, to be back home uh, in North Wales. And I'd like to acknowledge the very warm welcome uh, I've had from our staff, um, partners, uh, IMs, and other colleagues. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Jill for her work uh, whilst she was acting uh, Chief Executive. And I'd like uh, to take a moment just to acknowledge the impact of COVID today across North Wales, um, to acknowledge uh, the sorrow, uh, sacrifice, and the support of all of the people uh, of North Wales uh, to keep us as safe as possible. And of course, to pay a tribute to all of our staff, uh, their family and friends, who are supporting Betsy Cadwallader in all aspects of our pandemic response. Jochen Valian. Thanks, Joe. So, uh, of course, the organisation remains under considerable pressure and is facing uh, a complex demand in terms of COVID, both in terms of treating patients maintaining the TTP, the Test, Trace and Protect programme, and also now the vaccination programme. Uh, and, and with that in mind, uh, and bearing in mind also that we want to continue where we can to carry on business as usual, which is proven not the easiest thing to do. We have a meeting later today to talk about how we might focus on some aspects of business as usual. But in the meantime, I've decided to move the COVID update forward in the agenda. So we will turn to the COVID update immediately and, and Chris, Stockville will lead on that. Over to you, Chris. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll just load uh, the presentation up uh, now, Chair. <clears throat> oh. 
Okay, hopefully um, uh, people are able to uh, now see this. Um, I'll just minimise that down. Okay, so um, morning um, and thanks for uh, asking me to uh, provide an update on uh, coronavirus, its impact uh, in uh, here in North Wales. Uh, there's a lot um, to share this morning, uh, but I'm going to do it as clearly um, as I possibly can. Uh, I'm going to try and run through the slides and then um, uh, pick up uh, any questions at the end if that um, is okay. Uh, and in doing so, I'm going to try uh, and pick up some of the myths that are circulating as well and provide a little bit of uh, evidence um, um, behind uh, why they are myths. Um, First of all, um, let me provide an update um, regarding the amounts of coronavirus that we're seeing um, and the impact that that is having now on our uh, services. Um, you'll be aware um, of um, high levels of coronavirus in some of our communities that have been uh, for the last uh, few months. Uh, the highest level of uh, COVID-19 within our communities is to be found in North East Wales. So that's uh, Wrexham and Flintshire and to a slightly lesser degree, uh, Denbyshire. Uh, levels in some parts of North West Wales are rising. Um, and I don't want anybody to wrongly conclude um, that this is a problem uh, for the east of North Wales uh, only. Um, these increased community levels are resulting in, in increased numbers of people presenting to our hospitals now, uh, and that growth is continuing. Um, this illustration uh, shows the number of uh, positive uh, COVID-19 tests in each local authority area. And you can see um, Denbyshire, Flintshire and Wrexham on the bottom row, um, and you'll see how, how, how they are higher. Um, You'll also notice that in the last few days, numbers appear to have been reducing uh, a little bit. Um, there's a range of uh, possible uh, explanations for that, um, and it's too early to say for sure, but we're hopeful um, that the government lockdown just before Christmas is at least contributing uh, to this. Now, although it is possible that the lockdown uh, conditions have resulted in uh, a little bit of improvement in the communities, it's too early to say that for, uh, for, with confidence. And it's also too early to see that impact upon our hospital admissions. And that will be the case for a, a number of weeks uh, yet to come. Furthermore, if we don't get those levels further down, then it will cause uh, a challenge uh, when we come to a, a period of deciding whether or not lockdown is con con continues because those levels need to be really low. Otherwise, they will surge uh, back up again uh, when people return um, uh, more to their normal business. Um, this illustration shows the weekly admissions into our three district general hospitals um, uh, and it picks up on the point I've just uh, made. Um, we're seeing the lowest levels um, uh, being admitted into the in the west into Aspiti Gwynedd, uh, middleish levels uh, in the centre into uh, Glencluid, um, and the highest levels at the moment in the east into uh, Wrexham Myler. And whilst the levels of admissions um, is currently highest in the Myler, I am um, uh, concerned um, that the uh, COVID uh, admissions in the last couple of weeks to Glancluid and to Aspiti Gwynedd are uh, increasing. And um, that is um, uh, something uh, we need to keep a very close uh, eye on. Now, although just over half of admissions um, are aged over 70, and that's shown in the red uh, on the chart in front of you, um, a sizable uh, number of younger people uh, are also requiring admission to hospital. Um, and, and, and it's important to recognise that the risk of serious illness uh, with COVID-19 is absolutely not just limited uh, to older people. And younger folk who think that they're not at risk are simply wrong. Um, I will come on to that um, uh, a little bit later. Just to remind you of your appointment oh. tomorrow and um, Friday the 22nd at 3.20. And so just to let you know, obviously things are a little bit different at the moment. You're on mute. So when you arrive for the door we're locked, um, just give them a look and Lucy. Sorry, I thought I was. All right, carry on, Chris. 
Chris, you're on carry on. You're on mute. Me. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, uh, so I've, I've discussed the fact that uh, at present, there's a disproportionate number of uh, COVID-19 uh, inpatients um, in, uh, in the Myla. Uh, this slide shows how our inpatients are currently uh, distributed. Um, we've currently got uh, 284 um, patients receiving inpatient treatment at the moment for coronavirus. Um, patients are in our district general hospitals, they're in our community hospitals, and they're in uh, inpatients at the moment in the Envis Hospital uh, in Deeside. Sorry. <clears throat> um, moving on then, um, in terms of uh, capacity, um, our three district general hospitals are currently operating in excess of 90% uh, of, uh, of their uh, occupancy. Um, I've just noticed that there is a typo on uh, the Welsh part uh, of, of this slide. It is 90% uh, occupancy, and that's including surge capacity deployed on uh, each uh, of our sites. Um, the number of surge beds that we use um, on each site varies from day to day, and that's because of a number of uh, factors, um, such as whether we can flex wards from green to red, or depending upon the different number of presentations and the types of presentations uh, that arrive at each uh, hospital site uh, each day. So we flex that very carefully um, across different sites. Um, this increased uh, use of uh, surge capacity also applies to our critical care units, all three of our critical care units. And you'll see from the figures there that, uh, for example, with Wrexham, we currently have surged critical care in Wrexham to more than double uh, their normal um, um, uh, number of critical care beds, and that is uh, entirely due to uh, coronavirus. Um, health workers um, are also affected by coronavirus, and this is a subject I'll uh, revisit uh, in later slides. Um, as you would expect, um, more members of staff uh, working in the east of the health board uh, are off work due to coronavirus, and that reflects that there are higher levels of coronavirus within those communities. Um, additionally, uh, many members of our staff have been redeployed or they're having to work in different ways, um, partly because of their health vulnerabilities and the reintroduction of enhanced uh, shielding uh, advice. Um, we're also doing uh, considerable work in terms of uh, meeting the demand of some of the additional activity uh, that coronavirus has brought uh, for us. And that, not, that is not simply um, uh, additional activity on uh, the wards or uh, contributing to the additional activity for TTP, which I will touch upon uh, later, but it's also things like the vaccination programme and how we can increase um, uh, the number of staff required to provide a mass vaccination programme in such a short period uh, of time. And this slide, uh, shows um, some of that uh, work and how individuals um, are uh, currently in the pipeline or have recently um, uh, been uh, um, uh, in post, uh, some of whom um, are, are completing their training and some of whom have already uh, completed training. Um, I want to uh, spend a few minutes uh, to share the impact of these challenges and uh, what we're doing uh, now to manage uh, the challenges. Firstly, we've established an operational control room which coordinates the distribution of work across the health board uh, in a way which keeps uh, people safe um, and keeps the disruption to people uh, using our services to a minimum. Um, and I touched upon uh, the complexities of surge beds uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, and we do that um, uh, in coordination uh, across our district general hospitals uh, so that we're only um, moving uh, services where it's absolutely necessary for a short period of necessary and surging beds in the right place. Um, an example uh, then would be the temporary movement of some of our surgical activity from Wrexham Myler to uh, Wrexham, uh, to, to Aspity Gwynedd and Aspity Glanclerid. Um, 
In this way, we've been able to continue the urgent surgical work uh, for those that have required it, but who might otherwise have gone to Wrexham, rather than having to postpone it because of uh, the number of, of patients with coronavirus uh, requiring care in Wrexham. We've also seen staff redeployed um, to other services. Um, we've seen different uh, differences in staffing ratios so that we're able to uh, care for as many uh, people as possible. Um, and um, uh, all of our sites uh, have seen that. And other surge plans uh, in place, um, including as, as I've touched upon already, uh, the expansion of, of critical care. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit more about critical care um, uh, before moving on. Um, you've heard already that we've had to significantly expand our critical care beds to deal with the uh, number of patients with coronavirus requiring intensive care, and that's uh, interventions such as ventilatory life support. Um, in this presentation, I've used the word phenomenal uh, twice, um, and uh, the first uh, of those uh, is on this slide, and, and that's because I want to call out uh, the absolutely phenomenal response uh, that our intensive care and respiratory teams have uh, provided and continue to provide, despite fantastically challenging uh, conditions. Um, besides the sheer pressure of dealing with twice uh, the number of patients and having to do that wearing extensive PPE, which whilst it keeps them safe, is not at all easy to work in. They've witnessed some tragic patient stories, uh, all of which brings um, an additional uh, psychological toll. Um, some folk have required long stays in critical care, um, much longer than we might see with other conditions. Uh, we've had, for example, over 20 patients who've required more than three weeks of critical care uh, due to coronavirus, in addition to their uh, other uh, care. Um, we've had 16 uh, individuals in uh, critical care here in North Wales who have been under the age of 40, uh, touching upon the point I made earlier about how this is not just a disease of, of people who are a little bit older uh, than that. Now, despite all of that, the teams have still managed to strongly contribute to uh, the uh, coronavirus research that is under being undertaken in the health board. And, and we've had a participation uh, here in, in uh, the health board in 18 national and international coronavirus research trials. Now, I can firmly say without any doubt in my mind uh, that if you need critical care, you'll receive some of the best critical care in the world here in North Wales. Uh, and, and, and it's right to call that out because it's something that we should be rightly proud of. Um, so going back to the beginning of the slide, phenomenal um, in my view is, is no overstatement. And the very least that I can do in this presentation is to call that out. Um, moving on to hospital outbreaks then. Um, despite uh, the very best of uh, precautions, it's inevitable um, that there will uh, when there's so much uh, coronavirus circulating, be some occasions when uh, people requiring uh, inpatient uh, healthcare um, uh, contract uh, coronavirus whilst uh, in hospital. Our infection prevention and control teams have continued to support the frontline teams to reduce the level uh, to the lowest amount possible. The chart here shows that um, the distribution of cases in the Myla over the last uh, seven week, uh, several weeks has, has been predominantly from the community. The light orange hashed section on the chart, um, which uh, as you'll see is the majority of cases, are all of those cases where we know categorically they have been admitted with COVID from the community. Um, the blue and the solid orange areas are in patients with coronavirus who could have come in from the community, but we can't uh, with, with coronavirus, but we can't be certain of, of that, or who may have acquired it within hospital. Um, in every case of hospital acquired uh, coronavirus, we do a full review um, with our clinicians, and that's a matter of course, uh, because it allows us to identify any areas of learning uh, that could reduce uh, hospital transmission even further. Um, at the moment, we have some limited closures in three of our community hospitals in, um, uh, in North Wales, uh, and that's to uh, control 
um, potential hospital outbreaks um, and bring any hospital transmission to uh, a rapid um, end. Um, NHS uh, healthcare is only part uh, of a, a bigger healthcare jigsaw uh, and board members and members of the public uh, will have seen on the news uh, some of the many challenges that uh, have been experienced within the care home sector. Um, here in North Wales, we've instances where care homes, either because of residents with COVID or staff, um, have really struggled to be able to deliver uh, the uh, high standards of care that they would uh, want to be able to deliver uh, short term. And for that reason, uh, along with our local authority and other statutory public sector partners uh, across North Wales, we've got a tight collaboration uh, which steps in and provides whatever temporary support is required uh, in order to uh, provide some specialist support um, and sometimes just the simple support that allows that home uh, to continue to function um, um, uh, through, through the pandemic. Um, at times, that's required uh, quite a lot of input from the health board and from local authority staff uh, in particular, but we're grateful um, for the support uh, that everybody has shown uh, in doing that together. And together, uh, we have managed to keep uh, care homes uh, operating in, in the way that uh, we would want them uh, to uh, be. Um, just before I move on to vaccinations, um, I'm just going to touch uh, very briefly upon uh, TTP. Now, TTP is the Test, Trace and uh, Protect um, uh, programme. Um, this has been, and it continues to be, a large and important piece of work um, and again, uh, we're grateful uh, for the consistent approach that our public sector partners have brought um, uh, to this uh, across North Wales. We've adopted um, a partnership approach to this because it's another example of work where we all have a role and can work uh, best if we work uh, together. Uh, in terms of testing at present, uh, we have uh, slots for around 4,000 tests. Um, um, and capacity within the uh, laboratory to process those every day. Um, we take tests from a number of different sites across North Wales. Um, in addition uh, to the laboratory testing, um, there are uh, areas of path work, uh, pathfinder work being undertaken within the health board um, uh, using uh, things like uh, the lateral flow tests. Now they're the tests uh, that are similar to pregnancy tests. Uh, where a rapid result uh, can be provided. Um, those tests do have a number of technical challenges, which uh, like other organisations, we are working through. Um, I'm not going to go into those challenges here um, uh, fully, um, but it does mean that we're spending a lot of time uh, working out how we can support that uh, area, uh, which is an area of, uh, of rapid change uh, and development. Uh, as another example uh, of how our teams have uh, diversified to meet the uh, expectations uh, from the pandemic. Um, finally, on TTP. Um, uh, this is the programme uh, that coordinates contacting people uh, who have a positive result uh, and, tra uh, and tracing uh, people that they've been into contact with. You'll understand, therefore, that the last um, month or so has been extremely busy. Um, we've had a really good response time in North Wales for contacting people uh, with coronavirus. Uh, but in recent weeks, we have um, on occasions breached our local capacity to be able to do that in the way that we would like. And in those instances, the national uh, TTP team in Wales have uh, come in um, uh, in support uh, to help pick up some of the uh, extra activity. And we're grateful uh, to them uh, for that. We're currently recruiting additional advisors and tracers, and I'm pleased to say that we have had a good response um, and uh, are working through um, uh, the deployment of, of those uh, individuals now. So um, moving on uh, to vaccinations, um, we're currently um, using both the Pfizer uh, vaccine, uh, vaccine and the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine in North Wales, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, never, uh, never has a topic uh, been more poured over or dissected uh, than um, uh, vaccination. Um, and we're seeing that in all parts of the UK. Um, and never 
uh, has a vaccination deployment program ever been more rapid or more complex? Um, it is extremely uh, complex. Um, it's important to uh, remember um, that the AstraZeneca vaccine was only licensed in the UK three weeks ago and the Pfizer vaccine not that long before that. And it's normal and it's to be expected that the distribution chain in those first few weeks can, a, can be a little bit lumpy and bumpy before it settles down. I can recall many years uh, when the first few weeks supply of the annual flu vaccination into GP practices has had to be changed without much warning or delayed in those first few weeks before it then settles down uh, into uh, a more predictable pattern. And in that respect, this is no different. Now, like other areas, we've experienced those lumps and bumps in vaccine uh, availability. And um, uh, alongside that, we've needed to train uh, some of the individuals, uh, additional individuals I've already referred to, uh, to be able to administer uh, the vaccine um, and the associated uh, administration. Now, I understand that that's frustrating, but it is to be expected. Um, we are now seeing increased amounts of vaccine coming through. We've got an infrastructure in place, um, which I'm confident can rapidly uh, deploy that. And I want to be absolutely clear uh, that we have no concerns that the supply being made available to us will be insufficient, nor that we'll be receiving uh, or have been receiving our fair share. In the coming weeks, we'll see a rapid rise in the number of uh, vaccinated uh, people um, here in, in North Wales, and the plan is clear uh, about that. Um, one of the challenges uh, in the week um, has been, um, has been uh, being able to share information in a confident fashion to allay uh, anxiety. And, and uh, uh, whilst recognising some of those early lumps and bumps and the day-to-day the -day uncertainty, um, I, I do realise that it has been difficult for everybody involved. Um, I'd like to apologise for any stress that that, uh, that not knowing uh, about uh, when your vaccination will be could cause. But the last thing that we wanted to do uh, was to invite uh, elderly or frail people to mass vaccination clinics, only to then have to cancel the appointment if the vaccine consignment was delayed by a few days. Now that the supply chain is showing uh, signs of settling, uh, then we'll be able to start booking a little bit further ahead and will confidently uh, be able to provide uh, more information to people. And related to that, uh, there is a joint uh, letter that has been sent to all households uh, by their respective local authorities. Uh, and I am aware uh, in recent days that it's possible that some of those uh, letters have been delayed uh, in, in some areas, but they are um, uh, on their way. Um, this slide uh, shows an overview of the vaccination time uh, scales, and they're built upon um, uh, the National Vaccination Programme here in Wales, upon the scientific advice uh, that the UK Chief Medical Officers have provided, and upon uh, the advice from the Joint Committee of Vaccinations and Immunisations. Um, you'll see uh, that the top four cohort um, here, which are, are uh, outlined in yellow, um, will be completed by uh, the middle of February. Uh, and we have uh, no, uh, no uh, reason um, to believe that uh, our staffing uh, model, our supply of vaccine or the deployment method uh, will prevent us from uh, doing uh, that. Um, the approach that we're taking is a combination. Um, we're using mass vaccination centres and local uh, primary care delivery and that's for uh, good reason. The AstraZeneca vaccine is much more straightforward to deploy um, and all of our GP practices are now putting in plans to deploy uh, that vaccine. And if they're not already deploying it, and over half of them are, uh, then increasing numbers of GP practices um, over the course of the next week uh, will be um, uh, commencing their uh, delivery of that vaccine. The technical comp components of the Pfizer vaccine, uh, which requires specific ultra low temperature storage and then has to be rapidly deployed once it's thawed, makes it impossible uh, for each of our 98 GP practices 
or our community pharmacies to just safely uh, be able to uh, maintain those supplies. We just cannot do that with the, with the Pfizer vaccine. So we'll be using that in the mass vaccination centres where we can administer a whole batch uh, within the licensed timeframe uh, after it has uh, been thawed. Uh, hence the reason then for a combination of mass vaccination centres and local uh, primary care delivery. Um, we'll be delivering, uh, having said that, we will be delivering the Pfizer vaccine in two of our primary care clusters um, over the course of the next week uh, in, uh, in a pilot to bring GP practices together to see then if we can administer um, a, um, uh, in the required time frame uh, by uh, practices uh, all working uh, uh, together. It will be the first time in Wales that that has been possible, but we're confident about it and it will be in addition to the existing uh, mass vaccination centres, uh, which uh, are now set up, are operating, are increasing uh, their throughput week by week, um, and to which actually many of our primary care clinicians also contribute. In addition, um, we have uh, community pharmacies that will also be deploying the AstraZeneca vaccine in the next uh, few weeks. And that follows a successful pilot, which has been undertaken again here in North Wales, uh, which was uh, the first uh, in Wales and one of only a handful uh, in the UK. So um, going forwards, um, I firmly expect that the uh, early lumps and bumps uh, will settle down and that, that will make it much easier for us to be able to provide the clarity that everybody uh, rightly expects uh, to uh, receive. It means that we'll be able to book your appointments without having to then cancel them and rearrange them. Um, and hopefully uh, we'll then uh, reduce the stress and frustration and, and angst uh, to everybody involved, including uh, those working on the project, as well as uh, members of the public. Um, the increased amount of vaccine uh, that we're uh, already uh, receiving uh, means that our mass vaccination centres are moving uh, towards uh, seven day working. And as I've already mentioned, uh, we've got uh, our GP practices and community uh, uh, pharmacies coming uh, online. Um, and so the next few weeks, uh, we'll see significant changes in terms of uh, being able to get through those uh, early um, uh, groups uh, of individuals and to meet uh, the time frame uh, as I have uh, just referred to. I'm coming to the end uh, of the presentation uh, now, but I do uh, wish to uh, formally record uh, an urgent decision that has been made. Um, in the first wave of the pandemic, uh, we established a COVID cabinet, which was made up of a smaller number of board members, including the chair, the chief exec, independent members and some of the executive team. And that was to allow us to make urgent decisions that needed to be made, uh, but uh, allowed us to make them uh, with, uh, within formal scrutiny and governance processes. It worked well, and so we've reintroduced uh, that uh, approach for this second wave. Um, since November, uh, the, since the board meeting in November, we've met uh, three times, um, and most recently uh, have agreed that from the next board meeting, we will be submitting a regular assurance report uh, from Cabinet uh, on a scheduled basis. Prior to doing that, uh, there is one decision uh, to record today, and that is the endorsement um, of Cabinet uh, of the executive team uh, recommendation uh, that planned uh, care activity in Rex and Myler be temporarily reduced as a consequence of the surge of coronavirus admissions seen on that site. I've already discussed this um, and uh, the plan uh, in terms of minimising that impact, uh, how we, uh, we are triaging uh, individual cases before considering any suspension uh, and redeploying as much activity to other sites. The temporary suspension is um, uh, for an initial period of two weeks and as I, I've, uh, I've said, uh, uh, was endorsed. Uh, and so I bring it through uh, here today. Um, my last slide then um, is a brief summary, um, but it introduces that second use of the word phenomenal um, and it relates to staff uh, again. Um, I've called out uh, the work being done by our intensive care and our respiratory uh, uh, care colleagues uh, already, but um, 
they are but one small part of this large uh, collective of staff that work uh, within this health board and in fact partner organisations. And in my view, they've responded magnificently uh, to uh, the surge of activity that we've uh, recently seen. Um, that surge is not over. It's impacted upon everybody's working environment, each and every one of us. Um, but within the health board, we've seen people pick up extra uh, shifts. We've seen people change their hours at very short notice. People temporarily move to new places of work, to new clinical areas of work, uh, as well as new physical places of working. We've seen people sometimes redeployed into areas that are completely outside of their normal comfort zones. The surge isn't over and we've got to do everything that we can to ensure that those staff uh, are able to continue to do uh, what they do best. So um, from a vaccination pro uh, perspective, um, I absolutely understand the frustration uh, that everybody feels. Um, we do need to hold uh, the faith. The numbers are now stabilising in terms of the supply chain. We have clear plans in terms of how we're going to administer those. And we are seeing those numbers come through um, in terms of uh, vaccinations uh, administered. On that, uh, I'll uh, finish uh, and pick up any questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. OK, in terms of this item, and others, I asked for any questions to be notified beforehand. That was just to assist me in managing the time that we have available on the agenda. And of course, that doesn't deny others the opportunity to ask questions, and I've certainly got some. But uh, Medwin, you notify the questions, so you go first, please. Yes, I am Kaderis. Thank you very much for the report. I was glad to hear, Chris. That there will be adequate provision and I really hope that this will happen and I hear that the logistics are quite complicated and you're talking about the bumps in the system. In moving forward to the beginning of the spring, will those who have received the vaccine be coming back for a second vaccine and considering the bumps that we initially had, Will this uh, put more pressure in the system? The question I'm asking really is the capacity that we will have at the spring, will it be adequate? Uh, thank you, uh, Medwin. So as you're aware, um, at the moment, um, uh, the approach in the UK is to administer first doses uh, and to delay um, uh, second doses until advised by um, uh, the chief medical officers. Uh, we're working very closely with Welsh Government to um, uh, plan uh, how, how that works through. Uh, in terms of capacity, both in terms of vaccine and in terms of appointment slots, um, the requirement to administer a second dose has been factored in. What I can't tell you right uh, at this point in time is exactly when that will be, because that decision hasn't been made by the uh, Chief Medical Officers. Thank you. Lucy. Uh, thank you very much for that um, uh, presentation and summary, Chris. Um, I, I'd certainly like to um, as well reiterate what you said about um, the size of this vaccination programme. Um, I mean, it's absolutely unprecedented, the, the, um, uh, the sheer amount of work and planning that's had to uh, um, th that's been involved in this and I've heard some excellent feedback about both the experiences of patients going to their GP practice um, who have picked this up very uh, last minute um, and also the mass vaccination centres as well so uh, first of all uh, you know a, a great thanks to all of the staff who've been involved in both the planning and the administration there. Um, I just wanted to pick up if I could please on the, um, the, the slide that you gave us about the vaccination uh, time scales, um, uh, where this is the prior, you know, you've, you've explained about the priority groups that have been identified by the Joint Committee for Vaccination and Immunisation. Um, this has been probably the biggest area of concern for a lot of people. It's not just about when they're going to get vaccinated, but what order that vaccination is, is actually going to be. And so I've got two questions around that, if I could, for clarity, please. 
The first one is um, around the clinically extremely vulnerable um, patients. Um, I believe they're in group four. It's not, it's not clear from the slide. Um, but, but secondly, as well, about the definition of frontline um, healthcare staff. And, and I believe it's referenced in the Green Book, but perhaps you could clarify exactly um, how that is being defined by the Health Board, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Lucy. So in terms of um, the uh, vaccination cohort, then um, that um, uh, I referred in the, in the presentation to how that had been um, decided on a national uh, basis. Um, and that really is on the basis of those people who have the greatest uh, risk from uh, coronavirus getting, getting their vaccinations uh, first. Um, you're correct to say that those um, individuals under the age of 70 who would be considered to be clinically extremely vulnerable um, are in cohort four. Um, and so uh, as we complete the first and second uh, cohorts, we'll be moving on to the third and fourth uh, in order to get those completed uh, by the end of uh, February. Um, in terms of uh, frontline uh, health or social care workers, um, those are individuals in cohort two. Um, there has, it is fair to say, been a considerable debate across organisations. I'm not referring to North Wales, I'm referring to the whole of the UK um, in terms of exactly what that definition um, uh, means. Um, very, very loosely for individuals um, uh, to help them. Um, if they normally receive the flu vaccination, they can expect to be within that group. Uh, but we are working and continue to work on that group to be absolutely sure that we are including people who may not necessarily be a nurse or a doctor or a physio or a pharmacist actually on the ward, but who still have a presence uh, within the hospital, who walk through that hospital, who come into contact with individuals in that hospital or in a community health and social care setting um, and are therefore at higher risk. That is the reason that they're in the second group, because they're professionals who have been uh, uh, who, who are at, at exposed risk um, from coronavirus. And those individuals should therefore be receiving uh, the vaccine. Um, it is a list which is uh, constantly being um, added uh, to. Um, and, uh, for example, bringing in uh, private providers as well as um, NHS and local authority providers. Um, and we have to add um, individuals that we weren't aware of to that list uh, on a daily basis. So it is constantly a, a moving um, a process. But, but the very short answer to your question is if you are at exposed risk um, in a, a health or social care environment uh, due to coming into contact with uh, or potentially coming into contact with people with coronavirus and then uh, at risk of uh, transmitting it through the hospital or uh, local authority or care home setting, then you will be considered to be part of that cohort. Thank you, Chris. Did you have a second question, Lucy? Or does Chris cover them both? Um, well, he, he has covered them both, but I, I would also um, uh, appreciate some clarity over what happens for the um, our, those in the private sector. So, you know, our physiotherapists, podiatrists, etc., and how they would actually access the vaccine. It, it's easy for our staff because they've got the, the, the booking mechanism. Um, but I just wondered how, how we're making sure that our private uh, workforce who uh, are essential to our patients are being covered as well, how they'd access it. On our uh, vaccination um, uh, web uh, pages, um, which um, are very frequently um, viewed, um, as you would imagine, um, there are contact uh, details uh, on there. And um, um, if people uh, provide uh, their details, uh, then uh, there is an established process within the team um, to be able to add them uh, into uh, the list and then to make sure that they uh, uh, receive uh, the appropriate appointments. Um, there are some of our bigger providers that we are aware of uh, where we have liaised uh, specifically with them, but of course we won't, won't have a full uh, list 
of individual private physiotherapists, for example. Um, and so uh, we're relying upon individuals to also identify themselves as well as us find them. Uh, thanks very much for that, Chris. Okay, Jackie. Uh, Bonjour. Um, Chris, I was just wondering, there's been some publicity in the Daily Post this morning regarding staff in various areas, um, not exclusive to BCU, but in our local councils as well, sharing their invitations. And I just wondered if you wanted to make a comment about that and and whether we're, how we can actively uh, stop people sharing the invitations inappropriately. Okay, thank you, Jackie. It is um, difficult. It's human nature. And um, we are very clear with our local authority partners in terms of what frontline uh, means in the same way as we are um, uh, elsewhere. Um, the uh, booking invitation, uh, when you then arrive um, for your vaccination, there is then a process to go through, uh, which includes validation. So I would encourage people to try and wait uh, for the slot uh, that they are uh, supposed to be in, uh, rather than to uh, try and get in, into a higher cohort, because the likelihood is that they uh, will then um, uh, experience some difficulties working through the booking system, which then adds complications, not just for them, but also in terms of uh, uh, taking time up for um, uh, an already very busy team uh, to work through. So, so I would ask people not to do that um, where, uh, where it is a clear uh, attempt to uh, circumvent the expectations of that cohort. However, the same principle applies. If you are a, a local authority or a other um, health and social care worker who is at occupational risk, you are entitled to being in cohort two and your local authority has the details on how to add you into that. Thanks, Chris. Can I, can I just highlight as well the, the requirement to support the staff we've got working in the vaccination centres, as, as it may be contentious if they ever have to turn somebody away? It is really uh, difficult, and, absolutely. And they need additional yeah. support. Yeah, I, thank you. Can I just lend weight to your statement, Chris? Whilst we understand the concerns, people should not be doing what they're doing. The priority groups have been identified with clear medical guidance and sound reasoning behind it. Uh, so people jump in the queue are depriving someone else potentially of receiving the vaccine at a point in which they should. Uh, I think the other point to note, Chris, is uh, this is a temporary problem, I believe, because we're changing the booking system. So this is not going to last this opportunity much longer. Uh, and I know, having visited the mass vaccination site at D-Side, that our staff are looking out for inappropriate booking by people in any organisation uh, out with those priority groups. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's that's absolutely correct in terms of the booking system. Um, um, uh, just just really just to, to reiterate the point, some of these uh, folk are um, um, trying to book the system, but the um, majority of them are actually uh, more likely than uh, not entitled to be in a cohort two. And if they approach their local authority, and identify them to the local authority, they can be given their own invitation, which then allows them to work through the system in a much smoother way. Okay, thanks, Chris. So I see no other hands. I've got a couple of observations and a couple of questions. So my first observation is to repeat the fact that the delivery plan for the vaccination program has been published today. Uh, it has been sent to all stakeholders. It will be appearing on our website. I, I think that's important in terms of uh, providing another sense of assurance around the fact that there is a plan, albeit there always was, but what that plan contains and what's being done to move the vaccination programme forward. Uh, and, and that will shortly be accompanied by uh, an enhanced data set that will give people, including the board, a clear sense of where we're moving in terms of the trajectories of the vaccination programme. So in that regard, can I just uh, explore the expectations set by the Minister this week? that by the end of this week, seven out of 10 in terms of over 80 uh, age people, care home staff and health board staff would have been vaccinated. And uh, do, do we know where we stand in terms of meeting that expectation of seven out of 10? Um, 
So the data that I have uh, in front of me today from uh, the whole of um, the vaccines uh, delivered up to yesterday uh, morning, uh, which was the most um, up-to-date uh, extraction from the, from the national system, uh, grouping together those first two cohorts together um, falls a little bit short of the 70%. However, I am aware that uh, many of our vaccines this week are loaded towards the end of the week. Um, it, it, looking at the Pfizer vaccine in the mass vaccination centres, we've got over twice the number of trays this week as last week loaded towards the end. Um, so um, I, I uh, probably need another day to be absolutely clear whether or not we're going to meet that target. But if we don't, we won't be very far short of it and we will exceed it in the beginning of next week. So can I ask that the uh, executive team notify the board before the end of the week? Uh, where we're likely to stand and where we stand at the end of the week, please. I think Absolutely. that's an assurance point. Uh, I, and I should have said it earlier on, but can I thank the executive team and their teams for producing the delivery plan? Because I'm saying I think that's important. Uh, can I, uh, my second uh, observation would be this. So we're issuing now more vaccinations and have issued more vaccinations than any other health board in Wales. In fact, figures have just come, come through now from Welsh government and you know, we've issued over 7,000 more than the nearest health board. But we're still some way behind, aren't we, in terms of winning uh, the league table or being top of the league table. And I regard this as being important, given our community's safety is at the core of this, in terms of the proportion of our population that's been vaccinated against other health boards. So how confident are we, Chris, that we are going to move up that league table and indeed top it uh, in terms of proportionate representation of vaccination across our community? Okay, so um, I'm absolutely confident, and I'll tell you the reasons for why I'm confident. Firstly, as you say, uh, our numbers are um, uh, now ahead, and in fact, we have vaccinated slightly greater than our uh, percentage population, um, uh, help, bearing in mind health board size, um, uh, than would be expected from the overall figures. Um, much of that increased activity has been uh, the consequence of increased um, um, throughput uh, over the course of the last couple of weeks, which was exactly as we expected it to be. And that uh, increased throughput is continuing. So I would expect that growth uh, to continue. I'm also absolutely confident because year upon year, and it isn't a competition, but year upon year, we consistently uh, perform um, at the top uh, when it comes to our flu uh, vaccination programme. We have no difficulty in delivering uh, mass vaccinations. What we have a difficulty with is this being such a huge and rapid deployment that there are a little bit more lumps and bumps in those first few weeks that just need uh, to, to settle. But once they're settled and they are settling, I have no doubt that the team uh, will deliver um, exactly as we expect them to do. OK, and, and Sue Green, can I, can I just ask you to uh, comment on how we're managing the workforce challenges? It's a clear uh, area set out in the delivery plan. It's clearly complex, given the other pressures we face in terms of the sites uh, and maintaining other services. But can you just give us some, some assurance about uh, how you and your team are managing those challenges, please? Certainly, Mark, and, and that's partly why we, we wanted to include the, the, the kind of the profile of, of workforce against the workforce requirements, particularly for vaccinators and vaccination assistants in the, in the presentation this morning, because it, it is clearly something that, that is exercising a, a, a lot of, of colleagues. I suppose one thing I want to, to, to say and to highlight is, as Chris has, as Chris has outlined, we do have considerable experience of... of um, vaccination programs and rolling out vaccination programs this is a different type of program for, for for in part no other reason than we are doing it in phases more often than not vaccination programs and particularly vaccination for programs such as the flu etc are open to all but targeted at some this is this is very different and so the, the, the human nature approach is, is it has been and continues to be quite challenging um in terms of workforce, as, as Chris alluded to, the, the, um, the plan relies on a number of steps and a number of um, different medium for the delivery of the vaccine. Quite a lot of which includes um, the setting up and establishment of the centres, so the vaccination centres, either hospital, mass or, 
or, or local. The original plan was based on a hybrid between our existing trained vaccinators, and we have over 600 across the organisation who've been very heavily involved in, in peer vaccination models previously, as well as as a recruited um, vaccinators and vaccination assistants, volunteer vaccinator and vaccinator assistants. Clearly, as we went into, into the, the, the end of 2020, it became really apparent that the more that we could, we could um, balance the requirement to pull clinical staff who are the experienced trained vaccinators off clinical services with, with recruiting um, and, and bringing in as many volunteers externally as possible. So that has shifted the plan a little bit. The plan details the fact that we almost have a have a have an order of deployment with our trained internal vaccinators being the last on the list. Um, we have needed to use those vaccinators to start with as we built up and scaled the workforce um, available. But the hopefully the trajectory gave gave colleagues some level of confidence that we are now in in kind of a full rhythm of bringing people into the organisation, training them and then deploying them. One of the biggest challenges that we've got at the moment is the capacity to, to bring people in and train them and for them to use their skills immediately. The, the scaled up plan really does enable us to scale up the workforce alongside and to move forward the bottleneck that we've, we've got at the moment, which is, which is a good bottleneck to have of people who are ready to deploy really really keen really enthusiastic but we we have to make sure that we're deploying them into a model that has trained vaccinators who are there to train competency assess and then deploy at, at a reasonable ratio um, and that doesn't detract from the delivery of the vaccination in, in in the first place so so it's slightly complex but it's a nice it's a nice um uh, element of complexity i think at the moment so as the ramping up goes forward, we'll be able to bring more of the people who've put themselves forward in, get them trained, get them deployed um, uh, through the, through the programme. Thanks, Sue. It was noticeable yesterday at the mass vaccination site that the role of volunteers and the, the manager of the site saying, you yeah, know, they simply couldn't be doing what they're doing without the volunteers. You know, some of them doing it full time. It's, uh, it is brilliant to see and extremely helpful to us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the volumes are are massive and I suppose it, it it's just worth it's just worth noting so we've talked about figures of you know having around 1400 expressions of interest and that and that's fantastic getting through the the volume of those interested people is 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 really a, a big challenge but we're, we're 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 managing it it is just worth noting though that very very many of of, of the people have put themselves forward are giving are giving up kind of one day or one day a week, one day every couple of weeks, um, and so the conversion into kind of almost whole time equivalents is 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 it is at a much different rate than we are than we would normally see, and I think there's just there's just that to bear in mind. So the balance of continuity of of, of staff in the centres alongside and enabling people who've put themselves forward to do to do shifts for want of a better phrase is it, it is a fine balance. I think too, so correct me if I'm wrong, that the ministry have been of great assistance and they've also committed to providing us with more support this week. Yes. So we've already got we've got vaccinators and vaccinator assistants in, in role now. And we have uh, another tranche coming in um, and they're currently being vaccinated and trained now to be able to deploy uh, next week. Also, I have to say local authorities have been fantastic. We've had support from um, Airbus in terms of their occupational health. And we're working really closely now with the, with the Fire and Rescue Authority as well. So they're, they're providing us with some additional assistance, which is, which is fantastic. OK, thanks, Sue. Uh, so, and thanks, Chris, too. Uh, I think that was a very useful session, a really important session. I know it's taken up some time, but it was uh, and is at the heart of what we're doing at the moment. Can I just uh, say thank you to the executive team, uh, also your teams, and uh, particularly our frontline staff who are at the, the, the coalface, if you like, uh, for all that you're doing and continue to do to help us to respond to competing challenges and particularly around the coronavirus. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. So without further ado, I'm going to move us on uh, to apologies for absence. I've got apologies reported for Avion and Sue. 
I'm grateful for Eric Gardner deputising for Sue today. Uh, I'll then move on to declarations of interest. Any declarations of interest to be notified? I've got one, Mark. Uh, I need to declare an interest on item 41, the residences paper, um, due to um, Adra, my employer's uh, interest in a partnership approach. Okay, thank you. That's noted, thank you. Thanks very much. So we'll then move on to the draft minutes of the last meeting. Are people happy with the accuracy of the minutes? Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we'll then turn to the action table uh, itself. Uh, so the first open action uh, is listed for Adrian, uh, which indicates a paper has been drafted and a decision weighted as the appropriate route for consideration through the government structure to come in February. Uh, Adrian, if there's any lack of clarity uh, in that regard, can you, can you pick out with Louise outside the meeting for me? Absolutely, Mark, no problem, thank you. So we'll get it tabled at the appropriate point uh, place in February, yeah? Yes, we will, yeah. Okay, the, the, the second open action uh, rested with Gavin, uh, Gavin, which was in terms of briefing note uh, to be drafted and submitted to the board and CEO. Uh, Joe, I believe you've asked for some more work to be done in that regard. Uh, yes, I have, Mark. Yeah. So uh, we'll leave that open and, until we see that paper uh, via Gavin uh, or from Gavin with your approval, Joe, if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the final item uh, was in respect of Welsh language, Trace has had to leave the meeting to attend the uh, strategic coordinating group in respect to the floods, but the update is noted there. Uh, the, the paper is now being listed for the March meeting. So uh, unless someone tells me to the contrary, that is the action table now dealt with. Yeah, okay, thank you. The, the next item is briefing notes and members. One was circulated around savings delivery. I've got some questions around that as Chair of Finance Performance Committee, but I'll pick that up outside with Jeff Lang uh, and the finance team and that meeting has been arranged. Uh, so we then move on to special measures, uh, which is listed for Jill. Thank you, Chairman. Um, happy to present this paper, which is an update um, on our special measures. As you all know, um, the the minister, um, the minister stepped us down from special measures um, uh, in December of last year, uh, following a number of conversations with the tripartite. Clearly, the organisation were pleased to receive that news, but um, were not part of the decision making. We are clear that we remain in targeted intervention, and this this paper sets out two things. One, uh, the, uh, there is an appendix to this paper which articulates um, uh, the Simon Dean um, document that was shared with Welsh Government to um, help inform progress against special measures within uh, Bethsick and Wallada, but also our ongoing response to the targeted intervention. Um, the Health Board is now working very closely with Welsh Government um, to identify how we best demonstrate improvements across um, the areas where we need to um, be transparent about how that, um, that how that progress is being monitored. We are adopting a maturity matrix approach to this and we have a board workshop uh, later in February to be able to articulate exactly what that looks like and how that will be presented both um, to the public and obviously um, via our boards and to Welsh Government to assess our progress. I'm happy to take um, questions, but um, the routine um, arrangements for those monitoring via JETS and via other uh, interactions with Welsh Government um, will clearly be part of that monitoring framework. Thanks, Jill. So uh, on Monday, Joe and I had a call with uh, Welsh Government officials about the maturity matrix. Uh, that was a helpful conversation. Uh, I think Joe will agree from our perspective to understand the sense of direction. And we're expecting that an outline document to be made available to us before we come together at that, that workshop that you referred to 
due on the 4th of February. So I'll, I'll keep colleagues in the loop as we move forward. Lucy. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Jill, for that. I, I think it's just worth um, reiterating uh, for our um, partners and stakeholders that we may be out of special measures, but you know we we absolutely understand as a board that we still have a long way to go. We have made uh, a, a lot of improvement as the, as the letter from Simon there uh, articulates, and we have moved a long way, of course, from uh, where we were when we originally put in special measures, but. Um, coming out of special measures, of course, we recognise as a board does not mean to say that we haven't still got a lot of work to do. I think it's just worth reiterating that. Um, and there is a lot of work going on, particularly in relation to uh, the um, work relating to the governance framework uh, that, that Simon has been working on. And um, uh, welcome Louise's input um, into that going forward as well. Um, and also, of course, the mental health division. We're still working very hard to make the re required improvements um, in relation to that. Thanks, Lucy. I'd go so far as to say it probably hasn't changed at all the, the amount of work going on or the level of focus that's been applied either by the board or the executive team. So yes. thanks for highlighting that. Thank you. Okay, so we'll now move on to uh, items for consent. Uh, I'm intending to move these on block if I may. So I, I'm intending that we uh, ratify without discussion the twex, section 12 doctors uh, list of additional. Mark, I think you've put yourself on mute. I have, thank you, Jill, for that. So I intend to uh, move the items of consent on block unless there are any objections. So. I'm asking you to ratify the attached list of additions and removals uh, under section 12 and also to note uh, the document signed under seal uh, as uh, notified by Louise. Are you happy to do both those things? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we now move to items for discussion. And the first is the uh, quarters three and four operational plan monitoring report. Mark. Okay. Thank you very much, Chairman. So this report describes our performance up to the end of November against the commitments we gave in our Q3 and Q4 plan. I'm aware that the end of November is a little while ago now, and that's due to the timing of uh, board meetings and actually a more up-to-date position describing our, our performance up to the end of December is going out today to members of the Finance and Performance Committee. I'd like to advise the board that, with the, in that report, we've stepped up the um, the detail um, in that report, and that we will be going forward, including commentaries on both red and amber rated actions. There are a handful of reds in this report that the board will be will be aware of, and I just wanted to give a you know a, a, broad, a broad sense of where I think we are. Uh, the first one that I wanted to highlight because uh, a question had been posed around it. The first red in the report relates to an action to review the capacity of external providers. So this is about looking at independent sector and other providers who might be able to help us with our planned care uh, challenges. That was a red rated action at the end of November. I'm uh, pleased to be able to advise the board that that, was, that, that that action had been completed by the end of December. I think looking at the report more, more generally, it's possible to see challenges in two areas. I think we do face significant challenges around planned care, particularly around eye care, neurodevelopment, neurophysiology. There, there are quite a few red and amber ratings in that area. And I'd perhaps also like to just pull out um, the, our informatics uh, function, our informatics teams that I think are facing a, number, facing a number of challenges. And there are a couple of reds in that area as well. The implementation of the emergency department system, uh, the board approved the business case just a few months ago, um, is now back more or less um, on, on track. Uh, but I think issues remain for the implementation of WPAS um, in the West. And I think our teams are looking at the case to reset the deadlines for that WPAS implementation. And I'm sure that will be coming back to either the board um, or the committee um, in due course. So I think those are the points that I wanted to highlight, but I'd be happy to, uh, to take any questions, Mark. Thank you. Joe, do you want to come in first? Uh, 
um, Mark. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, yes, thanks for the opportunity just to uh, give uh, board colleagues uh, an update. Uh, as I mentioned, de day 14. Uh, but um, I am keen to open up a conversation with uh, IMs and executive directors working with uh, Louise uh, to uh, consider whether the format of our board papers and uh, our appendices uh, continue to be um, as we wish uh, to see them going forward, particularly in the context of uh, the previous uh, agenda item targeted uh, improvement uh, and acknowledging uh, the improvements in governance that, that uh, are being implemented uh, with regard to board assessment frameworks and so on. So it is my intention that uh, we do um, really uh, take a very long, hard look uh, at um, the content, uh, the style, and the degree of assurance our board reports um, are able uh, to give us uh, with a view over time uh, to making uh, improvements, working in partnership um, with IMs. Thank you. I don't need to speak on behalf of colleagues, but I will say I, uh, I welcome that uh, intention. Uh, and I know my colleagues uh, will do, particularly the chairs of the committees, Joe. So uh, we look forward to working with you on that, and Louise. So, John. Thanks, Mark. Um, just to uh, support Joe's comments, I think, I, as you said, we need um, consistency and the right level of detail in terms of responses. And I think Mark's addressed some of the questions I had which really go to the, the narrative explanations in terms of uh, where we are with particular uh, actions that are in the plan, now, in terms of what are we doing to recover things, what's the timescale for the recovery. Now, the, that's been bypassed if the next report says, well, it's been, it's been delivered, so that's great. But I think in the narrative, when we see the reports, it's that, it's that understanding of, okay, when something's read, we know there's an issue, it's about the clarity of understanding of what, what is being done to try and recover it and when will it be recovered. The two particular points I wanted to pick up was, one was um, item 16 in the report, which is about um, neuro uh, neurodevelopment, because it talks in terms of, it may take approximately two years actually to get to the conclusion of that. The note of concern I'd want to raise was, surely that scale of problem would have been known at the time the plan was put together. So it's just a concern around the planning process in terms of why are we in a position whereby something's in the plan being reported now is off track, um, but we've been told it's, well, it's going to be take, take two years to recover. It seems a, a, a big gap between what was planned and what the, the understanding is now. I think the only other one was again about uh, 17 5 of the business intelligence unit. Again, an understanding of when will that be back on track. Mark, do you wish to respond? Yeah, well, I'm going to suggest that perhaps Chris, I think Chris and I have both been uh, seeking uh, further information on neurodevelopment, but Chris, you can pick up the COVID uh, coordination thing as well. Okay, thank you. Um, if I pick up the last point, uh, then the business intelligence unit uh, reflecting that these are November um, um, uh, data, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, log uh, the current situation as being uh, read. Uh, the issue uh, predominantly related to um, increasing our analyst um, uh, support to be able to uh, support the business intelligence unit. Those individuals have now been. Um, uh, uh, through the recruitment process um, or are closing in on the, uh, a couple of posts are closing in on the end of the recruitment process. So I'm, I'm content that that's moving forward. Um, of the two questions, the one that is of greatest uh, challenge, um, of course, is the neurodevelopment. And there's been a number of issues that have uh, caught the team uh, over the course of uh, the last, uh, uh, over this last um, um, business year. Um, COVID has undoubtedly had an impact because of uh, social distancing and the impact that that has had upon uh, the way that some of the assessments are carried out. 
um, as well as the availability of some staff. Um, and, and the reference in the uh, document to um, uh, room capacity is a reference um, to that. Um, they, uh, there has been uh, early on a staffing um, uh, recruitment round, which um, was initially uh, very um, successful. A number of people uh, did uh, come in. Uh, a number of individuals didn't uh, come in. And, and having gone away and looked at that, it's clear that those individuals um, um, uh, uh, applied to lots of different organisations at the same point of completing their training um, and uh, did not necessarily uh, have the health board as their first uh, choice um, in, in, in any case. Um, my view um, is fr from uh, conversations with the team is that the uh, reference to uh, two years is unnecessarily uh, pessimistic, although the time period um, is um, significant. The team have chosen to put in the longest um, uh, time period there, which, um, which reflects some additional work that they've underdone during the course of the year um, in terms of um, what uh, time would be taken if they didn't change um, uh, the uh, pathway model uh, in neurodevelopment. Some of that work um, is underway now and, and we'll bring that down, as is some of the, the, the work with partners and uh, ensuring that people don't end up uh, inadvertently getting double assessments, which has previously been a little bit of an issue. What I don't have is a refreshed uh, date to be able to give you. Um, but I'm very happy uh, to provide that outside of, of the meeting because I, I, do, uh, I do reflect um, that this is an area that needs greater scrutiny. All right, thanks, Chris. I think, as well as the specifics as you've addressed, I think the, the partly the point I was making was the scale of the, the disconnect between the timescales and what was in the plan is something we just need to be aware of as we go forward with further planning approaches. I would agree with that. Thanks, Mark, as well. Thank you. So can you confirm the date outside then, Chris, for us, as you might oh. do, please? Yes, but yeah, I will. Okay, Cheryl. Thanks, Chair. Uh, and thank you very much for that, Chris. You've partly answered uh, one of my questions. Mark, I have two mm -hmm. questions. Um, the first one, um, full MDTs are taking place for all cancer patients you've put in there. Are we able to absolutely guarantee urgent treatment? Um, that that's what the public are, are asking, and that's what, what I wanted to ask you. And the second one, um, my concern is around CAMS and neurodevelopmental um, assessments. And are we able to try and roll out face-to-face -face, um, assessments for our most high-risk young people? That has to be of, of the highest priority right now. Thank you, those are my two questions. Mark? OK, thank you very much. So I'll, I'll open this up. So on the first one about full full MDTs for all cancer patients, uh, we reported in the, uh, the, the the previous COVID update, the cabinet decision about the decision to postpone um, uh, all but the most urgent surgery from the Rexham Myler site. I think part of our plan has been to shift work to the West. We're currently experiencing less pressure um, at Aspeta Gwyneth, and therefore what's happening now is some of the work that would ordinarily be carried out at the Rexham Myler site is now being delivered at the um, at Aspeta Gwyneth um, instead. So I think that is taking us some way towards that. In terms of an absolute guarantee, um, I'm afraid that I, I couldn't provide that. So I've perhaps looked to other uh, colleagues, I'm not sure, Jill, if you would wish to uh, comment on that from an operational um, from an operational perspective. Thank you, Mark. I, I can reiterate some of the comments that you made. So, in terms of uh, the planned care, I can confirm, Cheryl, that that is uh, we are undertaking multidisciplinary team approach sample input from myself, our, our plan, uh, amongst others. Um, Adrian, I don't know whether you want to come in on the wider cancer conversation. I can see your, your camera is on. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Jill. I um, spoke now I'm only back this week. As far as I'm aware, you know, all our MDTs have continued to run uh, throughout the pandemic. As Jill's outlined, we've provided uh, care, you know, 
uh, for patients. Cancer and colleagues had a really good plan around this, around uh, access to, uh, to therapy, uh, to uh, whether that be uh, uh, therapy or whether that was uh, radiotherapy. Uh, they certainly managed to introduce some extra clinics as well uh, around breast uh, in November, which I you know that had been a pressure point for us. We recruited uh, a radiologist. So they are uh, working extremely hard uh, and you know, doing everything they can. The Once for North Wales approach, the others uh, mentioned around maybe some patients moving from one site to another in order to maintain uh, their treatment. Uh, and to keep them on course. I think I'll, not much more to add than that. Thank you. Sorry, it's, it's probably... Should I have answered your question? Sorry, Jim. I was just going to add... Go on then, before I come back to Cheryl. I was just going to add, sorry, that um, we, are, um, we are risk assessing surgery that can only be undertaken at the MILA uh, on a daily basis. Um, and that is still proceeding where we think it's clinically appropriate and safe to do so. Cheryl, have you got the uh, answers that you need at this point? Yeah, yes, thank you, Mark. But I'm sure it's a... Uh, um, it's a very rapidly moving situation and um, one that, that we as IMs would be keeping very close eye on. But just to also thank um, everyone that's, that's working so hard on this. Um, this is the, the um, well, second priority, number one priority with, with um, COVID. So thank you. I know you've been picking up a number of individual cases with the, uh, the lead. So thanks for doing that, Cheryl, too. Thank you. That, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Mark, let's move from that uh, operational plan monitoring report onto the uh, performance report, if we may. Okay, so I won't say a lot about this, given Joe's comments about the work that we're doing as a team to, to refresh it. Um, it describes the performance up to the end of November. And as with the previous report, as a team, we're now looking at the end of December performance position, and that should be out with the FMP committee um, today. Um, I was going to make the point about planned care and pressures on planned care, but I won't, I won't touch on that. Uh, in respect of unscheduled care, um, I think it's fair to say that our system remains remains fragile and we, we are seeing periodically, not all the time, but we are seeing waiting times and ambulance handover delays that fall short of what we would what we would expect. And I think the, the report the report sets that out. Um, I'd like to highlight a couple of areas of stronger performance before I before I open it up for any uh, questions. First is our really strong performance against the flu vaccination. We've achieved uh, the targets. We've got a target for staff. And we've got a target for over 65 year olds and we've already achieved those those targets in terms of uptake and the campaign will continue to run until the end of um, March. But that is a really strong um, result. And I think the other one I'd like to, uh, to highlight is our uh, performance in terms of continuing to um, uh, conduct PADRs and uh, performance development discussions with our staff, uh, particularly in the context of the pandemic. And we remain, I think it's the second highest performing uh, health board um, on that measure. So I just wanted to highlight those, those kind of positive points. I'm happy to take any questions together with colleagues, uh, Mark, on this report. Thank you. And you were right to highlight the positive points, Mark, because I highlighted a number of them myself and I was going to comment on them. So thanks for doing that for me. Uh, so, uh, Lynn, do you want to go first with your question? Yes, good morning. Could I also praise the percentage of PADRs? Because I imagine it's an ideal opportunity for managers and staff to speak together and the agenda may widen from just the PADR <coughs> outline. So thank you for that um, increase and being able to sustain it. My question is, is to do with ophthalmology performance. On page 17, you do identify a number of actions that have taken place, such as the advisor being appointed and the collaboration re being reinstated. Is it possible for an update on where we are on ophthalmology, please? Yeah. Thanks, Leigh. I'm happy to happy to uh, to pick that up. I think it is it is correct to say that the pandemic continues to impact on our ability to deliver um, eye care measures. 
we're still we're, we're currently operating with a reduction in both uh, the number of clinics and also the activity uh, within those clinics. I think we're also battling patient appetite to actually attend uh, due to COVID-19 related um, anxieties. And we're seeing a number of patients deferring or not accepting offers of an appointment that in normal circumstances we would consider to be to be reasonable. Uh, we're exploring uh, opportunities to uh, to get our clinicians more involved um, in booking patients appointments to 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 allay fears. And we're also um, undertaking additional work uh, at weekends now um, through insourcing. And I think the whole topic of our performance on the eye care measures is the subject of a more detailed um, update to the Finance and Performance Committee uh, next week. But I think with the, along with the other, the full range of our planned care specialties, Lynn, uh, you, make, you make an important point um, there. So a lot of these people are, will, will be elderly. Mm. And as you say, they're rightly nervous, they're worried about coming in. Do you think we're doing enough to allay their fears? Because I imagine if the treatment isn't imminent, it could have some dire consequences. So there is a risk, certainly, of consequences no more than there are um, for our, you know, people turning, not turning up to our emergency departments because they are worried about that. Um, I don't know, I'll invite other colleagues perhaps to contribute on what we, what we are doing at a more local level to, to allay their fears. I'm, I'm not sure I've got a very detailed answer on that. I'd be happy to, to, to take that away and have a look at it, Lynn, but I don't know if any colleagues could provide a more, a more detailed answer now. If I may, Lynn, uh, I'm not sure I can provide a much more detailed answer. It's really difficult. As you know, our communications team are, are, are putting social media and very clear messages out that we're open for business. We discussed earlier in, in Chris's uh, report on COVID um, the, the, what were the procedures we're putting in place to keep, keep our individual um, patients safe. And as I say, the, the additional uh, work that we're bringing in from to support that from outside uh, we are um, maximizing the capacity that we do have but with all of these um, that we're discussing today all of these procedures including ophthalmology um, uh, we are carrying we know a significant risk but the message is very clearly um, if you are asked to attend an appointment uh, we are making it as safe as we possibly can for that to happen. And um, we are prioritising our patients, including our ophthalmology patients, recognising this is incredibly difficult time for people out there that are waiting those, whether it be for surgery, whether it be for an outpatient, whether it be for ophthalmology, Lynn. So I think, I think you're right, though, to give us the challenge, are we doing enough? And I think we need to take away that challenge and test it and perhaps work with people like our CHC colleagues um, to assist us in getting that message across. And I wonder also whether we could, are we involving the third sector sufficiently? Because a lot of these elderly people will not um, participate in social media. Yeah. Thank you. Agree, Lynn. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Lynn. Mark, it's perhaps worth saying that we were joined at last Finance Performance Committee by a, a consultant ophthalmologist, which I think was really helpful. Mm. Uh, and as you say, there's a more detailed update coming to the next Finance Performance Committee and our uh, hospital director in the West has assumed the lead responsibility for ophthalmology. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, and I've, I've relayed this to Joe, but you'll probably know it anyway, Mark, having spoken to Welsh Government officials, of course, our liaison official uh, is the lead for planned care. Uh, and she had some helpful views that I know she's extended to Andrew Kent and others on our planning care team about how we might shape up uh, the coordination of ophthalmology activity, particularly around some aspects of that activity. Okay, Lucy, sorry, Joe, do you want to come in on that subject before I go to Lucy? Uh, yes, please, uh, Mark. Um, just to say that um, I think um, our points are uh, made very well around uh, making sure that we're communicating with individuals who are going to genuinely be, be quite worried, but to use some more traditional communication method, methods. 
because not everybody is wedded to um, Facebook, Facebook and Twitter. So we'll, we'll take that as an action. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Lucy. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, uh, firstly, I just wanted to um, uh, highlight that it would, um, I'd welcome some uh, discussion as well about the format of this report too, uh, to make sure that we're getting the right information presented in, in, in the right way. Um, my the, but the main point I wanted to make was, I think it's worth calling out that the, um, the report highlights the fairly significant increase actually in infections, um, particularly Clostridium difficile um, that, that we're experiencing at the moment in the health board. And, and as the report points out, um, this isn't unique to BCUHB, um, it's, we're seeing it across the board. Um, from an assurance perspective, we discussed this at uh, some length in the um, Quality, Safety and Experience Committee um, and the action being taken against it. And um, uh, so I just wanted really to assure the board that that, that work is being undertaken. And um, you'll see in my chair's assurance report for the committee as well, that um, we've also discussed the pressure that the infection prevention and control team are under at the moment. So um, I just wanted to provide that assurance. Thanks, Lucy. There's a couple of areas I wanted to, to, to pick up. Uh, so first of all, Jill, in terms of unscheduled care, you and I before Christmas met with the clinical leads for each of the emergency departments uh, and they uh, made a number of suggestions, which I, I know are probably difficult to take forward, particularly at the moment with COVID, but can you just confirm how that work is being taken forward, please? I'm happy to, Mark, um, the Chair. We met, um, a group of us met with the uh, ED leads um, earlier this week, as it happens, Chairman, um, including members of Mark's team, um, because one of the questions that was put to us and it is feeding into the revised report, are, are we uh, providing the right metrics to focus on the safety and experience that our patients are, are seeing as they are delayed through ED? We're also, uh, I've also asked for a thematic review, which has been undertaken from our concerns team to um, undertake to identify any areas that we want to focus on most particularly. The final strand, um, and this was a presentation to that group, was um, working with Welsh Government, so Stephen Harris from delivery uh, quality delivery team are working alongside us to develop that pathway approach, particularly focusing on reducing the risk in our ED departments both by discharge, but also uh, working holistically with our community teams. There is a second meeting, uh, follow-up meeting being scheduled uh, to include a wider clinical workforce, but it's just to assure you that that work is being taken forward. And whilst it is difficult in a pandemic, given the pressures we're seeing from both the pandemic and our normal unscheduled care uh, requests, from, I think it would be seen to be um, irresponsible not to progress that work at this time. And then can someone just comment on delayed transfers of care, please? The information here is particularly listed for mental health, but from other data sets, we know there are pressures uh, and indeed, uh, Chris referred to earlier on in the COVID update around care homes and the, the impact from COVID. Uh, and also that's having some impact on delayed transfers of care out of our acute sites into care homes that are not mental health patients. Can, can someone comment on where we stand in terms of that dynamic? Uh, and also, uh, I think it's worth the board noting that, uh, and you might want to comment on this, uh, 30 patients now in the D-side temporary hospital, uh, having been there yesterday, 12 of those are more acute than we might have originally envisaged in terms of that hospital. So there's 30 patients, 12 more acute. I, I, I was really impressed with the medical and nursing team, but obviously the profile in that patient for those patients is changing that hospital. So can you just comment on DT, uh, delay transfers of care and the profile in the temporary hospital, please? Um, yeah, uh, if I pick up the uh, delay transfers of care then, um, so uh, I did refer earlier to the difficulties that we're having um, in terms of 
uh, helping the whole health economy um, uh, cope uh, with, with uh, COVID. And uh, a number of our care homes have, have struggled. Uh, the biggest issue for care homes um, is that when they have a, a member of staff or a patient test positive, it then results in them having to close for a period of time um, before they're able to admit um, uh, new patients, uh, uh, new residents into, into that home. And that um, certainly uh, causes some difficulty. I, I do have to say, though, despite that, um, our delayed transfers of care this year across all uh, six local authorities are significantly lower than this time last year. And, uh, you know, despite the huge amount of pressure that this has brought, to have those lower levels um, is, is something that um, could only be achieved by uh, the strong partnership uh, approach that all six local authorities are, 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 have taken to us. Now, that's not to suggest that there isn't space for improvement because um, uh, any delay um, uh, is is um, uh, is something we'd like to to, to avoid. But but certainly uh, within the context of of COVID, our, our transfers um, through into care homes is reasonably. Um, uh, strong at the moment. I can't specifically talk about mental health. That uh, what I'm referring to here is uh, adult um, uh, med medical um, uh, care. Chris, just now in that regard, so medically fit for discharge patients, it probably wouldn't be understood by some observing this meeting about how med how many medically fit dis discharge patients we might have in our hospitals because of uh, problems with the pathway to discharge. Can you? Do you just comment on uh, what pressure is being felt in that regard and uh, how it's being managed? Uh, so I can't, I, absolutely. I can't give you a specific number uh, today because I haven't brought it with me. Um, however, um, medically fit for discharge uh, individuals are folk who uh, are no longer receiving medical intervention in hospital that requires them to be in hospital. It doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have healthcare needs uh, that need to be um, uh, delivered in some shape, shape or form. But what it means is uh, they don't necessarily require that to be delivered in an acute hospital bed. Now, some of those individuals um, may be waiting to go back to their care home and or uh, that 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 uh, isn't able to accept them because um, um, of uh, recent COVID um, uh, instances in that care home, or they may be awaiting a new placement in a care home. But many of them are waiting for uh, interventions to be delivered for them to return to their own home. And we've seen an increase in the number of people uh, electively choosing to go uh, to their own home. We know that where possible, home is best. Um, and, uh, and so that's something that we're uh, wishing to support. But within the grand scheme of everything else that is going on, uh, this requires us to be moving um, manpower um, uh, resources um, out to be able to deliver more of that care in the community. Um, and sometimes we get that absolutely right and we can move people through quickly. And other times there's a, a little bit of a bottleneck um, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the capacity within a particular area. Uh, so I, I suppose the uh, overall message is medically fit for discharge um, does include those individuals going back to their own home as well as care homes. Thanks, Chris. Tracy, do you want to come in? Um, Oscar, Kdeiri, they're going to answer that in Gymraeg. If I may, and I will be speaking in Welsh. You will see the figures within the report in relation to the delay that has been. It is a challenge in relation to COVID across our systems in Wales. However, I am pleased to say that the daily meetings that we have within the mental health department are now helping those conversations. Everyone finds it challenging, but by working together, we can make a difference. And I do hope that things will improve in the new year. But we are doing everything we can in relation to monitoring and quality with the discharges, as it were. Thank you, Chair. Dr. Tracer, just to confirm that, particularly in relation to the mental health delayed of care. Yes, and the figures are on page 21. They are, thank you. Uh, then, Jill, can we come back to the, the profile of patients in the uh, temporary hospital, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. 
So uh, the considerations that have been, the pressures that have been identified throughout this meeting in terms of surging our capacity to meet the, no the needs of our COVID patients have um, led to our clinicians, our medical and nursing and therapy staff um, redefining uh, who we will uh, see as appropriate to go within the uh, MVIS hospitals. That has led to um, a pathway of, of slightly more acutely ill patients within the MVIS hospitals. I will say our staff have absolutely, um, I'm going to pinch Chris's word here, been phenomenal in responding to our request to provide um, medical cover and enhanced nursing cover to support that facility and the acuity of the pathway that's going through there. Um, that, of course, is being monitored. Um, and we are able to do that because um, of some of the services that are not working at the same levels as we've articulated earlier, uh, such as within planned care, being able to support those beds. But um, in order to uh, maximise capacity on our very acute sites, it has led us to have those conversations around the, the pathway and suitability for uh, MVIS and, and subsequently the staffing um, the staff mix has changed and we do have medical cover there. Okay, thanks Jill. So uh, they're the areas I wanted to cover. So if people are happy, we'll now move off of the performance report and we'll move on to the finance report. Uh, Eric. Thank you, Chair. So we reported in the position up to the end of October, which seems quite a long time ago now. Um, there was quite a big movement in October because it's when we got notified from Welsh Government of the transformation funding which they were giving us for the next three years. So that breaks down as 40 million to deal with our deficits um, and a further 10.3 million to deal with um, RTT performance essentially and diagnostics. And finally, a further 700,000 to deal with leadership in mental health, governance um, and organisational um, development this year. So what that's meant to the financial position is that we have reported uh, a surplus in month and overall we are now at a cumulative position of 200,000 um, underspent which is certainly a first I think for the health board since I've been here. The other big issues to note are that our savings delivery continues to be relatively poor considering what our target is but it's certainly in line with the rest of the organisations in Wales and probably across the UK where we are delivering uh, 7.2 million savings to date with a, a plan of nearly 16 million and the other big thing from my perspective to note is we've spent 74 million pounds on Covid related issues so far to date with a forecast of nearly 156 million now, as we've gone through months eight and nine, that forecast has come down a little bit um, as we've refined the costs and refined our plans, and particularly the cost of the Envis hospitals has reduced over the last few months as we've had final bills in for the actual setup costs. Um, we still have a number of risks, but those risks are working themselves out uh, and being reduced month on month um, from what we can do. We certainly don't expect any more significant risks to arise this year and we believe we are well on target to deliver a, um, a balanced position at the end of the year so effectively a neutral no overspend no underspend and um, happy to take any questions john thanks mark thanks eric um i just wanted to pick up on the covid costs uh, on page five of the report um it talks about the forecast of expenditure uh, and notwithstanding it says it's going to be reviewed, it does seem like a significant increase in the costs going forward in terms of the forecast. I'm just, can you expand on what's driving that uh, large increase? Yeah, of course. Thank you, John. So some of it relates to actually opening the field hospitals. So at month seven, they weren't actually open. We really didn't know how many beds we would open in the field hospitals and as obviously we've gone through and we're now in the middle of January that's become more crystallised although as we was being discussed earlier on Covid's increasing again our hospitals are getting busier so 
whilst costs have increased as at today, they are not as high as what we forecast at month seven. And the other big thing that really increases the cost towards the end of the year is the um, cost to put all the Enfys hospitals back to their original state. Um, and those costs have actually increased compared to the forecast that we had in October. They, they've almost doubled. Um, happy to bring back a more detailed forecast, but that has certainly gone through the Finance and Performance Committee as well. Yeah, I'm sure we'll talk about the finance performance, but it just it just struck me as I was looking at the report. Thanks for the clarification, Eric. <laughs> Other things to include, John, as well, it's the mass vaccination, um, TTP costs, all of those ramping up in the last quarter of the year. Okay. Eric, Joe and I have had a conversation with Welsh Government about the projected... Uh, underspend in terms of the uh, resources awarded to us uh, and a wish to uh, as far as uh, humanly possible use that resource to good effect to prepare us for what will undoubtedly be a challenge in a year next year too. Uh, some update in some form verbal will be will suffice would be helpful to finance performance committee next week about how we're approaching that particular issue and what okay. we need to to use that money wisely and effectively for the reason I just described. Yeah, no problem, Chair. The other concern I've got, uh, Eric, and, and it's a long-standing concern, which is why I've asked to speak to the finance team in Sue's absence and also Jeff is, that the, the reporting approach of placing savings under non-pay and reporting a overspend because savings haven't been delivered that it's just not, it's an anathema to me, that approach. And it, it, it worries me in terms of uh, how we're reporting expenditure and savings in, in, in that fashion. And I, I really would like us to try and reach agreement about a better way of doing that. Okay, I have to have that discussion with, uh, including Jeff as well, who's key to uh, how it works. Thanks, thank you. You're welcome. So any other questions around the finance report? No, okay, and it was subject to some scrutiny at Fires Performance Committee last week. And of course, as I've just said, we've got another meeting next week. So thanks, Eric. We'll Thank move you. On. So we'll move on to the Chair's Assurance Report. So can I ask that we deal with these by way of exception? So the first uh, is yours, Medwin, in terms of Audit Committee. Chair, I propose that we accept the report as presented. Thanks, Medwin. Any questions? No? Okay, thank you. We'll move on. Uh, QSC committee, Lucy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the only thing I just wanted to call out really was um, the we received an update. So this, this is the Chair's Assurance Report for the November committee. We received an update at the, uh, the January committee meeting, which will be reported to the next board. Um, in relation to the Holden report. Of course, the papers are, are um, available on the website and uh, for um, anyone who wishes to have a look at that, we had a really good discussion about uh, where that's taking us. Um, and we continue to receive updates on the Mental Health and Learning Disabilities Division um, around the four priorities that have been identified for that division, um, uh, which is showing really good progress. Thank you. The up, Lucy. Can I ask one question? There's reference in the report, uh, and Sue may wish to pick this up, around the IPC team and uh, recruitment uh, being progressed. Uh, the uh, request for or business case for extra capacity having been approved by the executive team. So uh, given where we are with COVID-2, can you update in terms of progress of recruitment, please? Of course, Mark. So we're working really closely with, with Jill and Deborah and team to, to make sure we can bring people in in the short term, but also the longer term recruitment. So we've moved through, I've signed off um, all of the vacancies to be fast tracked through the recruitment process with the, clearly with the necessary checks and, and balances in, but to be fast tracked through. I don't have the exact numbers as to where we are uh, to hand, but I can certainly provide these for you if that would help. No, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Good to hear it's been prioritised. Thanks. Thanks, Sue. 
so the next is uh, Finance Performance Committee, which of course I chair. Uh, I've got nothing to highlight other than that, which is in the report. I'll just repeat that uh, we had a consultant ophthalmologist at the meeting. We also had the uh, clinical lead for orthopedics as well, when we spoke about the diagnostic and treatment centres. And it was really helpful to have them both in the room. Uh, so uh, I suspect we'll be repeating that with other items moving forward. So without further ado, unless you've got any questions, we'll move on to Charitable Funds Committee, which is Jackie. Hi, uh, good morning again, or afternoon, almost. Um, just one thing to highlight, it says in the report that we'll be taking the staff lottery update to the local partnership forum um, in January. Um, we didn't, in fact, do that as we didn't feel it was appropriate at the moment to, to commence and continue discussions around a, a staff lottery. Um, the other item which actually isn't on the report is uh, an appeal from the Charitable Funds Committee to other board members to support us in, in approving and reviewing the applications we get to the fund um, so that we can apply more transparency to them. I'd appreciate if um, anybody who could volunteer would drop me an email um, so that we can include them in, in those application processes. And that's it, thank you. Okay, I don't see any questions, Jackie, so we'll move on. Thank you very much. On to the Mental Health Act Committee, Lucy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, you'll note there on the key risks section that um, unfortunately we, we highlighted again outstanding discussions to address recruitment and management of Section 12 2 doctors. Um, we appear to be having uh, ongoing discussions about this with little resolution. Um, so it was agreed at this last meeting that um, the executive leads would actually convene uh, to try and get this resolved. Whilst the recruitment itself is not that easy to resolve, it's trying to get a, an approach across all of the different areas um, of the, uh, the health board that, that needs to be undertaken to address this issue. Um, which has been ups, um, um, outstanding for quite some time now. So the uh, the committee was quite disappointed that this still hadn't been progressed. Fraser or Sue, any update from your good sales? Um, the Orchidea, Theresa, um, Alba, um, Lucy, you, Chair. As has been said, we do hope to bring people together and to have that conversation rather than going around in circles. And so that we can provide assurance to Lucy and the committee that things are moving forward. And that is a part of the, our tasks for the new year. Thank you. OK, look, I, I know people are busy, uh, but having identified the concern for some time, this meeting was on the 8th of December. It's now uh, the 21st of January. So. Can, can we move the conversation forward then and uh, ensure that those need, who need to speak about moving the uh, concern forward do so relatively soon, please? Certainly um, the conversations are already taking place, but we do need to bring a paper together for the committee. The operator, yeah. Okay, we'll move on to SPPH committee, Lynn. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I would just like to cover a very few number of points. Um, we received two reports on the impact of COVID and then on people with protected characteristics and the concerns there. And we also received a report of the negative impacts on the BAME groups. So it is good to know that these, these, these reports are being forwarded and the relevant um, actions are being taken, although it, it, it's not an immediate solution. We also discussed the social economic duty, which comes into force in March and, the, and what we need to do as a board. And I do I am aware that there will be training and awareness raising for all of us as board members. Thank you. So we just need to confirm how we're going to do that, because we haven't got another workshop before the 31st of March as things stand. So if you're going to need a workshop to, to address it with us or, or, or Lynn, you, you'll need to let us know. Yes. yes. Uh, Sally Thompson's um, involved in being in liaison with Louise to, to, to find a good way forward. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Sue. OK, so we move on again to stakeholder reference group. Frank on. Yeah. 
Yeah, thanks, Mark. I'll just pick up on uh, a few points, if, if I may, in the report. And one links into um, what Lynn's just said, actually. Um, the group obviously had an update on the pandemic response and our plans for uh, Q2 and Q3, I think it was at the time. And there was a lot of concern about health inequalities for the vulnerable and disadvantaged groups, of which BAME was one of them. So I will um, feed back to the group that uh, reports were presented to SPPH. Um, we then had uh, updates on primary care and mental health. And there's just a couple of, I suppose, communication um, points or advice we wanted to bring back to the board. Uh, we, 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 we had an update on primary care and um, there's a lot of support for the changes that have happened there uh, during the pandemic. But there was some tangible concern within some communities about the perception, and it may well now be a perception, uh, that they can't, uh, those communities can't access uh, various primary care services. So the group felt that we needed to uh, reassure the public about what services were available in the here and now. So that's one communication point. Then we had um, a very good presentation by mental health um, and uh, recognised there's still still a lot of work to do within mental health, but were supportive of uh, the strategy and also the developments uh, going on in the Ablet unit. Um, but um, the, the, it, it is a bit of a minefield, um, all the services that are available and how they interlink. And uh, for members of the public, the, the group felt that uh, we really needed to ex explore some form of communication plan that would better explain these wide range of services uh, to the public. Um, and then finally, uh, we had a, a very positive presentation on the diagnostic treatment centers the group are very supportive of this. I'm pleased that this came before the group uh, in advance of it coming to the board. It's in its early stage of development, as we know. So very pleased that that happened. Um, and the main point from there was that the group was um, very supportive of it, um, the DTC, uh, and also supportive of the two-centre approach to try and cover uh, the Betsy patch, the whole of North Wales. And whilst those no locations haven't been specified yet, uh, the approach of having two DTCs, nominally one in the centre west, as it's referred to, and the other one in the centre east, seemed a sensible way forward. Uh, that's it, really. Thank you. Thanks, Franco. Lucy, you've got your hand up. Uh, thank you. Yes, um, I just wonder if you could clarify, Franco, um, when you say that there's a tangible concern about an inability to access various primary care services. Could, could you sort of elaborate a little bit more, please? And perhaps Chris could could answer that, because I, I find that concerning. Yeah, it was in, in basic terms that the, the perception is that they, they you can't see a doctor face to face. And there was some, um, I think there were some discussions around, you know, when, when contact is made with, with various surgeries as to whether whether that actually results in, in, in an appointment, um, a face-to-face -face appointment. Um, so it was along those lines, really, Lucy, in basic terms, without elaborating further. I'll pick up. I, I will say that the <coughs> response given at the meeting was um, that, that, that um, the Health Board uh, will uh, and are duty-bound to, to provide face-to-face -face if, 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 it, if it requires. That, that response was given to the group. And nonetheless, the feeling was that because it's a perception and it was quite tangible within the group, that that should be fed back to the board. There was a lot of change right at the very beginning of the pandemic uh, in a very short period of time. Change which was absolutely in keeping with the strategic programme for primary care, but which we would normally have wanted to deliver over a longer period of, uh, of time than, 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 than occurred out of necessity because of course um, face to face consultations at that point were uh, minimized as far as possible because of the risk of transmission of, of coronavirus. Um, the challenge as always has been getting the balance right um, in terms of those um, uh, episodes of care that can be dealt with without uh, you having to uh, pitch up at a GP surgery. Uh, and I have to say, um, with 20 years of experience, uh, that there are an awful lot of those um, that could be dealt with in a much better way. And it surprises me sometimes how few complaints we get at the amount of time we do waste uh, of, of members of the public, dragging them backwards and forth for things that could quite easily be done 
uh, using other methods. And, and, and the feedback that we uh, got in the early days was very much the same as in other areas. Uh, some people are absolutely loathing the move to having to have a phone call or a video consultation initially, and other people thinking it was absolutely the best thing uh, that had ever happened uh, in primary care and long may it continue um, with, with various uh, observations uh, in between. I think it's fair to say that over time uh, that has settled down, certainly the number of concerns that uh, cross um, uh, my radar now are much lower than they were uh, early on. And I think in part that reflects that primary care has got more comfortable with uh, using uh, those approaches appropriately in the same way as, as, as perhaps the public has, has too. There never has been a point where if you absolutely need to be seen face to face and that's going to uh, change uh, your assessment um, or, or the intervention that you require, that that couldn't or shouldn't occur. And uh, up and down uh, North Wales or across North Wales, um, those face-to-face -face appointments are happening in their thousands uh, every day. So I think the balance is probably closer to what it should be uh, now. I don't dispute that there were some uh, teething uh, uh, problems, um, uh, of course. Um, I would just reiterate that if a face-to-face -face appointment is required, our primary care colleagues are providing those appointments and they have never been busier. And if I can just sort of jump in, it, the way I tried to present the point from the report was that um, perhaps it's a communication piece that's needed now to give that reassurance to the public um, around you know, what services are available in the here and now. So it's a comms piece, maybe. Yeah, I agree with that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Franco. Thanks, I was about to say that same thing, actually, Franco, because as, as Chris has just pointed out, the, in actual fact, the activity for primary care is 20% up from pre-COVID um, uh, times. Um, so uh, I, I think we could probably uh, work on communications better to uh, try and address that perception out there in the community. And as Chris said, it, it, that nobody has ever been refused a face-to-face, -face, even during... The, the height of the pandemic, if that was absolutely necessary and it couldn't have been done in any other way. So there's obviously perceptions there that we need to try and address. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Jo? Uh, thank you, Mark. I won't uh, repeat um, uh, Lucy's comments, uh, but just to say uh, during the course of the meeting, I've been keeping a little um, uh, list going of issues to raise uh, with our communication team. Um, they're all messages I'm sure that have been, um, uh, have gone out through various communication channels over time. But one of the things we are learning um, from uh, our COVID experiences, um, everything bears repeating across numerous channels because the uh, anxiety uh, and thirst for knowledge and information is incredibly strong. So. Um, uh, we will pick up the communication point. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Franco. So I'll move on to Healthcare Professionals Forum. Garen. Thank you, Chair. I'm Darth Powell. Um, uh, the notes you have there uh, reflect um, the discussions and advice we uh, uh, had in our December meeting. We had two excellent presentations. Uh, firstly, on, on the digital strategy, uh, and the second one, uh, like the stakeholder reference group, on the uh, emerging concept of the diagnostic and treatment centres. Um, just to summarise, really, then, I, I think the key point uh, that the forum um, had around the digital strategy was the need to ensure that we overcame digital exclusion in our population, and that was at the heart of, of, of the strategy, or was a golden thread running through it, uh, really to ensure that we... Uh, we didn't make health inequality in our population uh, worse. Um, in regards to the diagnostic and treatment centres, uh, again, strong support uh, for this as, a, as, a, as a, uh, an emerging conceptual model at, at the time when we were discussing it. Um, and um, I think one concern really to highlight, which was uh, we did note really as, for, as, as forum members that um, the concept was, was emerging really without the overarching organizational clinical strategy. So we, was, we were concerned that uh, a good idea, uh, as we felt it was, might be weakened by that fact when we 
uh, when we have the conversation with, with Welsh Government. Happy to take questions. Thanks, Gareth. Any questions? Uh, no. can I, Chair, it's Adrian, can I just come in, please? Yeah, of course you can. So, sorry, just because it's, just because it's not in the, in the report, um, just, just like to note, uh, Mr. Alton Murphy, was, he's been the optometry representative on the Health Professionals Forum for eight years now, and he attended his last meeting in December. So he's been an active member of the forum, and I think I'd just like to record our thanks to, to him for his, his commitment, his engagement, and his support of the forum. It will it'll obviously be in the full minutes, but just because we haven't noted it in our briefing, if we could just do that, really helpful. And, and you know, and gen genuinely, he's been absolutely brilliant. Well, he's been really good on the meeting. Thank you. Adrian, can you liaise in my office and we'll we'll write to him too? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very that. much. So that concludes the Chair's assurance report. So we've got three substantive items to go. Uh, and I suggest that we pause now and take a break because I don't want to uh, rush those items. So if we pause now and return at 10 to 12, please. And we'll restart the meeting dead on 10 to 12. Thank you.
Okay, we'll recommence the meeting. So the next item is the Board Assurance Framework and the Corporate Risk Register. Jill and Louise, are you ready? Yes, Chairman, um, we're ready uh, and it will be a bit of a double act. So uh, first of all, Chairman, can I commend the amount of work that the teams have undertaken in, in getting our board assurance framework to this place? As you know, this was a core objective of, of the board to put uh, risk management at the centre of everything that we do and to ensure that the board are fully sighted of those areas of highest risk. This has been through the audit committee and the, the format that we have adopted has been welcomed. I'm hoping that will be endorsed by the board today. Um, I'd also like to pick up the point that was made earlier in line with special measures. Um, this again is a key priority in terms of uh, ensuring that we respond to uh, a targeted intervention status but I would argue ensure that we are absolutely managing the business according to the, the risks and priorities within it. Um, the board assurance framework and the corporate risk register were reviewed by the risk management um, group earlier this week. And there was robust uh, conversations that did take place and that subsequently this will be updated to uh, reflect some of the challenges that were made during that meeting. Moving forward, the BAF will sit in the office of the board secretary, but I'd like to highlight the clear linkages and the clear working relationships between the corporate risk, risk register and the board assurance framework. I'm going to ask uh, Louise to pick this up now, but um, I am happy to pick up any uh, points, I'm sure she is too, in terms of uh, ways forward and any questions you may have. Thanks, Jill. Um, and I, I think I've only got a little bit more to add, really, and I, I indeed would in, endorse uh, Jill's opening comments about the, the level of work that has gone on in the team um, that, that Simon uh, and Jill have led to get to the, the, get the BAF into its, its current form. I do not underestimate that, given uh, the size and scale of this organisation. Uh, so that is uh, good work indeed. Um, and actually, yes, as, as Jill said, the BAF in front of you is, 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 is the... Um, the document I think that has been through board workshops that you've seen, um, also through the audit committee and, and the other committees that are receiving the, the cut of the BAF risks that's pertinent to them. Um, and indeed, as Jill said, we are now moving um, and working on this transition where the BAF is coming into the ownership of the Office of the Board Secretary. Very happy to, to welcome that in, into our ownership. But what is absolutely key is that we do contain that clear, very clear alignment to the Corporate Risk Register, working very, very closely with uh, the Corporate Risk Team. And during this transition period, we're just working that through very practically about what that, that, that looks like in, in reality. Um, and we're going to be developing some operating principles, which we will pull together in a narrative that, that helps you as board members actually understand how that works in practice. Um, central to this, as Jill's talked about, is the risk management group. Um, I was fortunate enough to attend a, a meeting of that earlier this week. Uh, that's a, a clearly very engaged forum, I think, that's got a very, it, it offers us a very good opportunity practically for the check and challenge of risks. Um, and certainly after having feedback from the, the committees and indeed the discussions in the risk management group, the next stage with the, um, the further refinement of the BAF really is, is a look at those. Uh, I think we're all uh, in broad agreement that the, the, the wording of the risks is right. I think the next piece of work on the BAF now is moving to what I call refinements. So that's a bit more in-depth work on looking at scoring target risk scoring and whether or not those are appropriate, looking at realistic timeframes for some of the actions that meet the, the gaps, and also some of that bit of more check and challenge on what is what are controls and, and what are assurances to just work some of that detail through. I think there have been a couple of changes, as I understand it, to the BAF uh, following some of the, the discussions that you all had when you, you saw it in its entirety at, at the workshop and, and at the audit committee. And I think that does demonstrate the, the, the dynamic nature that we want the BAF to be and what that you would expect the BAF to be as board members. So just pulling that through, that, that, that in practice means there has been a reduction in the scoring to the EU exit BAF risks and actually a, a standalone COVID BAF risk has actually been added as you, as you would likely expect given the discussions that we've had today. 
Um, so moving forward, the BAF will be scheduled in our uh, board business cycle. It will come through twice annually, and, and, that, um, and, and prior to that, it will have been to the audit committee as it makes its way through our governance structure. And indeed, prior to that, um, it will be shared with our, our committees, with the cut appropriate to committees for their, their, their scrutiny. Um, so I'll pause there. I think that's all I wanted to say. Now I'm very happy to take um, comments or, or questions on the um, sort of structures and processes around the BAF. Um, if indeed there are queries about the individual BAF risks, I, I may invite my uh, exact colleagues to comment on those as, as risk owners. Thank you. Okay, so I've got a number of people wanting to, to comment. So John first. Thanks, Mark. Um, Firstly, just to endorse the new format, I think that's it's an improvement, particularly changing some of the language in terms of uh, referral to in, inherent risk, and, and rather than the language we'd used before, is, is a is a is a much more appropriate way of, of dealing with it. But I've got a couple of concerns from an informatics digital point of view. We seem to have lost the risk somewhere from national systems, which was a significant and still is a significant risk to us as an organisation. I'm not aware that that's been discussed in any detail anywhere. It's no, definitely not come through DIGC. Um, and the other one is, again, really in the same area, is the health records risk seems to have been recast as a patient records, which we've had a debate previously in terms of the titling of that area, that it's not too restrictive in terms of its, its approach. And I'm just wondering whether we've done the same thing again in terms of it's been narrowed down to be just patient information rather than maybe a wider understanding of what health records are. Uh, it may be something we need to take out outside, but I've got concerns particularly around the loss of the, the national systems risk to us as an organisation. Can I just uh, come in there? Uh, can, we, can we discuss it outside, John? I think there's been a lot of dialogue between Dulan and, and uh, Louise's team. Um, it may just have been uh, missed in the uh, in the back and forth, but we can fix that fairly easily, I'm sure. Okay, thanks, Chris. Just on a more general point, I had an uh, introductory conversation with the chair of the new uh, national IT body the other day, and I said we a clear clear issue for us was to forge a renewed relationship with that body so as to ensure that we were uh, doing our utmost to secure national uh, digital support and also to drive the agenda where we can. Uh, I encourage them to, to uh, consider the role of our DRGC committee and also John, your and Chris's role. So uh, it'd be worth you considering how we follow up on that conversation. John, you're shaking your head. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute myself and it wasn't working. Right. Apologies. Uh, yeah, I've had a brief conversation with Bob, uh, the chair of the, the new Digital Health and Care Wales uh, recently. Uh, I am concerned about the governance of that uh, organisation in terms of it doesn't seem to reflect the relationship with us as an organisation or the other health boards. Uh, but you're right, we do need to build a better relationship with that, as, that, that going forward. And if there is an opportunity to, to link DIGC with what they're doing, then I'd welcome that. Um, we haven't had great representation from NWIS, even though we've been trying to get, get them uh, over the, the last year or so. Okay, all right. Well, we'll have to keep pressing on that point then. Thanks, John. Okay, Medwin. Uh, thanks, Chair. J just as a point of accuracy, seeing the, the Audit Committee has been mentioned twice uh, during this discussion, um, this wasn't the paper, the BAF report we're seeing today wasn't the paper that was presented to the Audit Committee. Um, we were asked in the Audit Committee to receive and approve the structure and the format, which we did do, but the content uh, was lacking in several areas. Uh, so I just want for, for a point of accuracy to make that point. And also you'll have seen from my, uh, my chair's uh, assurance report that the risk management group hasn't been quartered for the last couple of months. Uh, this is because of the pandemic and because of interim issues and we understand that and it's pleasing to note that you met this week and it's, it's back to normal. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Medwin. Um, 
uh, apologies. It was very much the format that 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 the audit committee were supporting, and yes, uh, the risk management group was core at this time and well attended. I would add so, um, and it was good to get that challenge. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, Lucy. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, first of all, um, I, I mean, I know myself the sheer amount of work that's gone into um, the board assurance framework and I'm very grateful for um, uh, Jill and Simon uh, sort of engaging me with those discussions as well. I was very happy to support that. It's absolutely fantastic to see this now as a document in front of us. Um, it's something that I think, uh, you know, we, we have needed for quite a while now. So uh, very much welcome it. Um, recognise as well it's um, you know this is the first time it has come in this format to this the, the board um, and of course it's not 100% we, but we know that um, the, the idea is that you know this is now a starting document it will be a living document um, and uh, you know it'll go on uh, as as development moving forwards and and I've had detailed discussions with Louise um, about that as well in relation to the corporate risk register we received the document that we've got here in front of us today, we received that at QSE uh, committee um, uh, last week, and I fed back a number of comments on that. I think it's fair to say there's still quite a bit of work to do in relation to the risk register to make sure that the revised risk management strategy um, is rolled out. And um, again, I was really pleased to hear from Louise about the very detailed scrutiny uh, that the risk register would, and the back was given at the risk management group on Monday, taking into account, you know, Medwin's comments about it wasn't core previously. So I hope that what's happened this week is actually going to be a reflection of the work um, uh, going forwards. And, and again, I would add my support from a quality and safety perspective as well, happy to support this work going forward. So thanks, thanks to everyone for, for their hard work on this. We've still got a way to go, but I, we, we're all on the same page on that. We all recognise there's still work to be done um, in order to get the organisation to um, a level of maturity on risk management and risk appetite that, that everyone is comfortable with. Thanks. OK, so with all of that said, then, are we uh, happy to approve the Board Assurance Framework? review and, re and note progress on the management of the BAF and corporate one operational risks. Uh, and some comment has been offered on the style and content of the report uh, already, but I'm sure that the dialogue around both documents will continue as we move forward. So are we happy to uh, support those recommendations? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. And thanks for work, Jill. Louise and team uh, for all that uh, has gone into producing those documents. It is a step forward, as you say, and it's an important step forward too. So, uh, well, now may I just thank um, I am colleagues that have contributed quite significantly to that as well. You may. I'm sure that's welcome. Thank you. So, okay, so we'll move on now to the audit, wow, structured assessment, and annual report. Louise, this is listed for you, but I think Andrew Downton from uh, Audit Wales was joining us. That's right. Yeah, very happy to hand over to, to Andrew to take, out, take the, uh, the board through these papers. Thanks, Mark. OK. Um, well, thank, thanks for having me here today. Um, yeah, I'm going to keep it relatively brief. Uh, we have two papers here. Uh, one's the structure assessment uh, report for 2020 and the other one's the annual audit report. Uh, the Structured Assessment Report is a review undertaken by Audit Wales um, across all health boards and trusts. Uh, the most recent Structured Assessment focused particularly on the challenges um, in relation to um, operational governance arrangements during the first wave of the pandemic, uh, financial governance and performance, and also development of plans and the, the response to the pandemic. So I don't plan to go into detail, but just really to highlight that overall, we found the health board has responded well to the onset of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, had suitably adapted its governance arrangements and program arrangements and plans. Uh, and this, uh, alongside the compelling urgency created by the pandemic, uh, helped to deliver a meaningful change uh, and a response with, with pace. Um, and I think there, there's probably something to learn um, after all this, this, this period um, in terms of um, delivering programmes of, of complex change, um, particularly in regard of um, restarting and recovering um, 
some of the, 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 the services in incoming years. Uh, the structured assessment report has passed through a clearance process uh, with the health board. And uh, once it was finalized, it went to the board uh, in a board development session early in December and went to audit committee um, in, again in December. And the audit committee will also be uh, tracking uh, progress against the three recommendations that we made. Turning to the annual audit report, um, that report uh, provides a summary of all our work that we've completed and reported in the 2020 calendar year. Um, all of that work summarized in the report has formally uh, been going, uh, gone through a clearance process uh, and has also been received in full at uh, the audit committee. Um, so uh, bring it together, the structured assessment and the annual audit report um, are here for the board to formally receive, um, but I am happy to receive any comments or uh, any other queries. Thank you. So any comments or queries? Uh, as Andrew says, we've examined and discussed these previously, but any comments or queries now? No, okay, can I, I, I will ask a couple of things uh, and they concern the recommendations. Uh, so uh, there, there are actions shown against the recommendations, uh, but there were timescales identified for October and November in respect of incident response planning and COVID command. Uh, and also uh, in respect of progress against delivery plans for November. Uh, Mark, they're listed for you. I, I guess some of the first will, will uh, relay with Chris and others, but uh, can you assure the board, Mark, that those uh, bearing in mind the dates that have gone, the progress has been made in keeping with the timescales that will be set. And can you just confirm where that's going to be reported to, please? Um, sorry, Mark, can you just point me to the, to, 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 to the one that you're looking at there, please? Right, if we go to the structured assessment, yeah. manage, management response to the audit recommendations, which is at Appendix 1. Yeah. So the, the first recommendation is concerned Resilience and incident uh, response reporting and planning. Yeah. Uh, you, you'll see there are three dates set in there, stage dates. So one is September, one is October, one is November. September is shown as complete, October and November isn't. Bearing in mind they're now past. So I, I'd want to be clear about where we stand against those deadlines that were set because I can't. I don't know that, and it will need to be reported sooner rather than later, given where we are with the dates. Uh, and the same applies to the third recommendation, which is concerned with progress against delivery of plans, which again was set for November and was listed for you, Mark. Okay, so we provided an update to the December um, SPPH committee on where we are in terms of um, all those recommendations. Um, but can I take that away and get back to you with a more detailed answer, please, Mark? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Lucy. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I would actually appreciate um, uh, a more of an update on uh, that third recommendation, given, given the caveats that were said at the beginning of this, um, uh, the presentation of that particular plan. The management response um, says that the outcomes are stronger at a programme level than previous quarterly plans. Um, I think it's fair to say, based upon a number of discussions we've had, that there's a lot more to do in relation to this. So completion dates now for, for November. Um, I, I think we need some more assurance as a board as to, to how that's going to be addressed and actually when that's going to be addressed. Um, I understand Joe has already acknowledged that there's work to be done on this uh, this particular report, but I, I, I just wanted to flag that up, really. Thanks, Lucy. And John wants to come in. John? Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, I, it was the recommendation around, or the comment around the, uh, what you, uh, is bidding on Cluid? and the, the recommendations around uh, governance for that sort of scale of project. I just wondered if it would be useful to get more clarity in terms of um, where the limitations were so we can assess uh, 
that against any improvements we've made. No, we examined through F&B in particular in great detail uh, that, that project and the various stages where costs increase and the, there were issues. And I'm not sure where it seen that there was a, 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 an issue in terms of the governance that we had. Um, so it would be nice to get some clarity of that so, to be able to inform ourselves going forward. Andrew, is that something you can comment on, or do we need? Um, I, I think it's going to be challenging. I, th I think probably um, as you're progressing through through um, plans, it's something to, to to refer against, particularly with some of the uh, major um, business cases that you have going through. So there, there absolutely will need to be a reflection of um, progress in terms of recommendations against the the YGC audit report that was issued last year. Um, but I mean, in, in terms of your the, the the strength of the res response to to uh, the recommendations, um, ultimately that that will be seen um, through your sort of business case planning and approval process, um, and that's sort of a core ele element that needs to be strengthened. Uh, I think previously today people have talked around the uh, diagnostic and treatment centre um, case, which may be progressing over the next 12 months. Uh, and I think there is uh, some reflection against uh, our recommendations in the YDC report, which um, equally apply um, to, to, to that case, but there'll be others as well. And we've had some discussion around what the learning from YGC, particularly at FNP, uh, and as you say, we're, we're adopting some of the, uh, the observations that were being made in terms of the handling of other business cases. So I, I'm confident we'd, we'd start to pick that up. Yep. Okay, Joe, Mark, can I can I then ask that you uh, you uh, review uh, progress against those dates and the recommendations in the structured assessment, and uh, let uh, me to start with have a view on where you believe we stand in in, in that regard? Because I know Joe that in in the respect to the last one, uh, you've already commented that you want to take a look at uh, some of the uh, reporting arrangements. So no doubt I will be captured in that, but. So can you take outside and come back to us, please? Yes. Thank you. OK. So uh, all that said, uh, we're asked to note the structured uh, assessment, the management response and the, uh, the annual report. Are you all happy now to do that? Yes. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thanks, Andrew, for joining us for that item. That's much appreciated. Thank you. So, Mark, we're moving on to the residential accommodation strategic outline case. OK, thank you, Chairman. So I have to say I'm actually really excited about the potential um, of this um, of this case and uh, the, the scope we've got, I think, to improve our performance um, in this area. Um, I think the case sets out uh, a clear need to improve the quality of the residential accommodation that we provide. This has been a long-standing issue uh, for the health board, and I think this case is a significant milestone in us starting to respond to that need. We also know there are clear links uh, and clear opportunities to, to boost recruitment and retention if we can, if we can offer higher quality um, accommodation. So this is a strategic outline case, and it sets out an indicative preferred option based on a high level analysis and I just need to emphasize that. I think that's particularly important in this case because the sensitivity analysis within the case shows that relatively modest changes in assumptions around risks or benefits can, can have a marked impact and can actually change the preferred option that would that would emerge through the case. So I think the board should be encouraged to support this because the SOC sets out a preferred option, but in many senses, it's a fairly likely preferred option. I think a key question for Welsh Government when they receive this case is going to be the availability of, um, of um, public sector public sector capital. And I think for that reason, uh, the, a joint venture option, which is set out within, within the case, remains a possibility, and it may well be something that we, that we return to. Submitting this case to Welsh Government after this meeting today, it's already been through FMP and was supported previously by the executive team, will we'll, we'll, we'll prompt that conversation on the possibility of availability of, um, of um, Welsh Government capital. 
with the best will in the world, these kind of longer term solutions uh, are going to be some time away. So I think it might be helpful to the board if I just um, updated on some of the immediate steps that we've taken to improve the, 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 the quality of the, of the accommodation on our, principally on our three main acute sites. We've identified as an executive team some revenue resource, a sum of 250K per annum on a recurrent basis has been identified from the rental income that we receive. And that money will now be, will now be reinvested um, in the maintenance and upkeeping of the properties. We're using some of our discretionary capital um, to, uh, to, to, to tackle some of the immediate issues um, that we face. And we've also set up local accommodation groups. Uh, so this is about the states and facilities working with the hospital management team, crucially involving users of our, of our accommodation to get their immediate feedback. So we set up three local groups and I'm involved in a kind of pan BCU group so that we can be more, more connected, I suppose, to these, to these, um, to these um, issues and perhaps has been the case um, in the past. So I think the case is, uh, um, well worthy of support. It's an important initiative. We've probably got a likely preferred option at this stage, I would say, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I, I, I don't have any questions shown, but I suspect there will be uh, questions. Any questions from members? Yes, Mark, <coughs> it's Lynn. Okay, thank you. And um, thank you, Mark. Mark, you've actually covered some of the points I was going to raise in your introduction because yeah. they weren't actually clear in the report. Because I, first of all, I must say, I fully support this proposal mm -hmm. and the importance and the relevance of having good quality um, residential um, residential um, flats and, and accommodation. So that, that that's a given. I felt the report was very negative towards um, registered social landlords. And especially if you look at the risk register, I think you weighed them, in my opinion, a little bit too severely. So, for example, one of them says is on the lines of general maintenance and the risk says that social re registered landlord wouldn't maintain. So I do feel that, that those risks were unfair. Mm -hmm. However, what you've said in your introduction is that this is a paper that's going to the Welsh Assembly Government for approval for their capital. Mm -hmm. I then, and, and that obviously is, is the best option of, of all. I just felt that your paper was a little bit negative should that funding not be available. And then we need to come back to our discussions with them um, the registered landlords, because I do believe they have a vital place and a role to play, not necessarily on every aspect, but on some kind of partnership working. Thank you. So, I, so I, I accept that feedback absolutely, and I think there is a fairly strong chance that we will be progressing um, a joint venture uh, with 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 an RSL or RSLs. Um, as we as, as we go through, we're already working in partnership. Actually, we've recently signed a partnership agreement with um, Adra to signpost, um, particularly in support of our international recruitment efforts. We're signposting new staff that are joining us to accommodation um, in the RSLs uh, in, in in the social housing sector in a partnership that we've recently confirmed. With Adra, so I think it's a fertile area for us to do much more work on. Um, so yeah, I, I I I accept your point about the risks, um, Lynn. Yes. So assuming that we do go into some kind of partnership arrangement, will a further paper come with different risks? So this is a SOC. So the next thing that we'll do, if this is supported, is that we will need to produce an outline business case. And that would be the case where we would firm up our preferred option in much more detail. And we'll have to go back and, and, and review all the options that are currently on the table. So nothing is off the table. Um, we, 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 we are not assured of getting public sector capital, in which case we'll absolutely be in the joint venture space. Uh, but even but, if Welsh Government said capital money was available, we'd still need to explore all the other options in more detail. In. Sorry for my confusion, but if the preferred option is Welsh Assembly Government funding and that's not available, does it need to come back here for, for us to um, reconsider what our preferred option is? So... I think we would need to report that back to the board. But if the board 
in approving the strategic outline case are accepting the case for change and the need to do something, then we will need to, to respond to that decision from Welsh Government when they, when they make that. OK, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Lynn. So a couple of observations from me, Mark. Uh, so some of our clinical staff have picked mm. up the fact that this SOC is with the board today. Uh, as someone reading this as a, a plan uh, to invest a considerable sum of money, which is what we hope to do. But I think there's a communication uh, aspect to this that you perhaps through those groups that you refer to need to pick up. Now, I've received an email in that regard, Mark, and I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you okay. from the clinical lead at, uh, at YGC. I, I think also, Joe, can I suggest it might be worth you and I meeting that clinical lead in any case, because he's the respiratory lead at YGC. And also, Joe, I think it would be well received if we were paid to pay a visit to the accommodation. I sorry, Fing, fat fingers on the video. Uh, y yes, uh, very happy to uh, to do that. I spent some time yesterday with the estates uh, team on, on one of the sites, and it was lovely to hear not only of the uh, um, work that was starting on one of the units at YGC, but also uh, to hear them speaking about the uh, support they're providing to uh, COVID positive individuals in those units, care packages, food packages. Uh, checking up on welfare and so on. Another example of estate staff, our staff, uh, stepping up in COVID. And uh, very happy to meet um, with uh, respiratory clinicians. In fact, any of the respiratory clinicians across any of the sites. Thank you, Mark. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll set that up. Mark, my other question is, uh, and going to what I said to Eric earlier on, you know, we want to use all the resources we've got available this year to, to great effect. This is an area of significant concern for those who are staying in the accommodation across the site. Uh, I know time is short and I know money is already allocated, but I don't know, Mark, if there's any scope for you and Eric to uh, explore the opportunity to spend more money on this accommodation in the interim, uh, particularly given we've got some flexibility around funding at the moment this year. So we have looked at that, Mark, but particularly, um, I think both capital and actually probably from a state and facilities revenue perspective, we just feel that it, it, it's it's really too late now in the financial year. That's the first thing to say. And also we're really struggling because of the site access restrictions as a result of the pandemic. Contractors, we're struggling to get contractors safely onto the site. So as much as we would be keen to do that, uh, we're genuinely not sure that there is much opportunity to do that, principally because of because of the pandemic and the, and the restrictions that's placing on us all right okay thank you thanks jackie you want to come in uh yeah thanks mark um it's just a question around around expanding the the bits where it's a, a so on page uh 14 we talk about demand and it mentions on-call doctors and i've noticed that on-call doctors feature in it but i just want to raise the fact that there are a number of other staff groups who provide on call within mm. the organization and and i think it would be helpful if if they were referred to as well because they yeah. often struggle to get accommodation currently because yeah. of the rules that have been put in place within the organization okay so just to highlight that, that they are there and, and and it would be helpful if they were included especially if we're moving forward with, with this okay yeah thanks thanks jackie Thanks, Jackie. So uh, then are we happy to approve the submission of the strategic outline case to Welsh Government? Yes. yes. OK, thank you. Thanks very much. Cheers, thank you. Thanks, Mark. So, Louise, uh, item of uh, summary of private board business to be reported in public. Very short. Uh, are you happy to uh, report the note? Yes, yeah, just just one substantive item um, as, uh, from from your last meeting held in private, and it was the to confirm the award of the primary care GP contract. So, okay, that's duly noted. Thank you. And then uh, we have various minutes from other forums uh, that are reported for information only. So, unless there are any questions around any of those items, I propose that we close the public meeting.
and the next date of the next meeting is the 11th of March 2021. So, Jokun Lao Yan, thank you very much, and, and who else?